financial help may be available. Julia? Julia on the go will post. You can only need to know the news and weather coming up on the half hour. Right now, let's send it over to the live Doppler HD Storm Center to get a look at today's forecast. Brian? All right, Sophie, weather this morning, blowing snow, our headline here. We're going to continue with that today. Sioux Falls, a winter weather advisory for blowing snow until 3. But around the area, Watertown, Marshall, much of northwest Iowa still has blizzard conditions uh, until late this afternoon or early this evening. So take note of that as snow is going to continue to rotate in here. You can see that clearly on Kettle Land Live Doppler HD radar network. And that area of blue likely swings through off and on today. Latest updates on roads, too. Interstate 29 is now open south of Sioux Falls, but it's still closed north of Sioux Falls, all the way to the North Dakota border. Also, uh, Interstate 90, Minnesota, South Dakota border east closed. Okay, so there's a couple little modifications there, but basically travel still no, not advised in much of southwest Minnesota due to the wind. And an additional two to three inches of snow today, and you got 40 and 50 mile an hour winds or better, and that's just kind of a miserable mix. More details at kettleland.com. Start the new year with huge savings at Cullen. To be fair, he unraveled the presidency. Donald Trump still wants a big going away party when he leaves Washington. New details about his planned departure next. The new MyWW Plus is our most... Severe constipation can happen, sometimes with serious complications. Anyone can struggle with addiction. If you're not waking up with Eric, Vanessa, and Eric every weekday morning on Dakota News Now, maybe it's time to make the switch. Eric and Vanessa have the news you need to start your day off right. And Eric has your hour-by-hour -hour forecast, getting you ready for whatever the weather might bring. Dakota News Now, weekday mornings from 5 to 7. It's news when you want it. Mayor Tenhaken here. While there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, we do know that taking simple precautions can help slow the spread of COVID-19 and save lives. We can all spread the virus even if we don't know we have it. So we must take extra precautions if we're high risk, wash our hands, practice social distancing, and mask up in public. These small actions can make a big difference, and we'll get through this together. Thanks for doing your part. in front of you uh, when you puncture that bio um, instead and, and that's not always been the case which leads to some excess doses or stray doses um, as far as the, the capacity of the system here I, I don't think it'll be that big of an issue uh, just because Pfizer is, is confident that this boxing container with, with the dry ice that can work out we haven't seen many apocalyptic reports of, of that failing yet um, they also have a level of temperature monitoring on these boxes where they can tell uh, if there's. We are at this crossroads in America, David. I think. The thing I've always loved about you, Tom, is the fact that you. I, I regard you as one of the best storytellers in sports. And when you look at. You, you know, you're starting with one of these amazing stories, Bruce, Breeze and Brady. Uh, and, you know, as somebody my age, somebody your age, you got to appreciate the fact that these older guys are still at the top of their game. And I think, Steve, at the core of that is not only the, the incredible dedication, the preparation in terms of all the film study, the rehab to your body, the, the incredible discipline when it comes to diet, famously so in Brady's case, but maybe something that gets overlooked, right, Steve? And that's love. They love to compete. Yeah. They love to play. They love the game. Like Brady has said over and over, you work six days a week. When you get to Sunday, in this case at 6.40 on Fox, right. that's play. That's not work. And the question hanging over this one is, if, you know, if Breeze were to lose this game, if Brady were to yeah. lose this game, how much more is there to their respective careers? So that's a tremendous subtext. Ten years ago, we found a Lone Depot because we were confident we could deliver the American who apparently served at different times, both for the National Guard and reserves. 
CBS News has learned videos like this drew immediate scrutiny because they mirror tactics used by law enforcement and the military to navigate hostile or unknown environments. What are small unit tactics? You know, small unit tactics are ways that uh, military can blanket and, 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 and communicate and try to get to a per primary target that they have. Frank Salufo is a former senior Homeland Security official. This isn't out of a basement. This isn't playing a whole lot of video games. This is something that there was some training here. There's no question. Once the Capitol was breached, CBS News has learned a D.C. police officer witnessed some rioters using military-style hand signals to communicate. It would not be unusual for people to come up with physical signals such as tapping them, pulling on them, something that would work in a crowd where you had a lot of noise and a lot of chaos. Why is the identification of individuals like this so important to the investigation? At the end of the day, uh, a, a small number of sophisticated actors can, uh, can, can do a whole lot of harm. This is shaping up to be one of the biggest cases in U.S. history that relies so heavily on videotape evidence. In addition to social media, CBS News has learned that federal investigators are pouring through thousands of hours of security camera video from the Supreme Court, the Library of Congress, and the Capitol itself, as well as police body cam video. Tony? Can't get through it fast enough. Catherine, thank you very much. Ahead, we'll look at allegations that some wealthy and well-connected people are skipping the line for COVID vaccinations. Welcome to America. You can always get the morning's news by subscribing to the CBS This Morning podcast. Get to today's top stories in less than 20 minutes. We'll be right back. This is something that people have been pointing out for many, many months now, since the very beginning of this conspiracy theory about the election. And so uh, to the extent that he didn't realize that's what was happening, it's probably because he wasn't listening. And I think it just highlights the degree to which in conservative circles among Republicans, there is such an echo chamber um, of just constant lies and misinformation that people are not hearing what the reality is and are not hearing the conversation that's happening happening in the rest of the world. When the president says that, you know, it, it, it's corrupt in Philadelphia and Detroit and Atlanta, it's only because those are places where uh, many of those voters, uh, majority of those voters are black. And he's not questioning the validity of the results of other parts of the state. And I think that was clear from the very beginning. So it's good that he's recognizing that now. He also, and again, uh, the apology is, is very carefully worded and thoughtful insofar as it goes. At no point does he say, it was a free and fair election. I was completely wrong to raise questions about the election because it was a completely free and fair election. And the reason I'm bringing that up, Abby, is because of our conversation with Ken Cuccinelli earlier today where we learned that part of this online chatter that they are hearing, Christopher Ray, the FBI, and others are hearing about possible attacks and fears over the next several days includes the persistent claim that Donald Trump won the election, which is still the claim that Donald Trump is making to people in private, and at no point as he declaratively said, I lost the election, which I still continue to think matters, and matters in terms of public safety. It absolutely matters. This is what is motivating uh, th this extremism. Uh, how can you try to stop extremism or denounce violence when you don't uh, try to address what is uh, the ideology that's motivating them, which is a lie? And it's a lie being spread by the President of the United States. Uh, you know, that's your, your point is exactly the one that, uh, that first came to mind when I saw President Trump's video uh, on Wednesday in the midst of his impeachment in which he tried to call for peace but never acknowledged that he started this whole thing uh, by indoctrinating his supporters uh, in a massive lie uh, and conspiracy theory. And until that happens, uh, you can't expect people to just uh, to, to just walk away from this. Uh, they all believe this because the president told them that it was true. And until he changes his tune, they're going to continue to be uh, steeped in these lies. And frankly, uh, the violence is probably going to continue because they're, they're just being told right now, stay away from Washington, don't come here. But that's not to say that they're being also told uh, what you are espousing is simply not true. And, uh, and you need to stop this entire uh, enterprise from beginning to end. They're not being told that by the president at all. Ken Cuccinelli also tried to tell us that um, President Trump gave a concession speech. I must have slept through that one. 
Uh, I mean, that, that, I guess that's what the people around him now consider that last video? As close as we're going to get I, is what White House aides have been saying. We're not going to get him saying, I lost, because he doesn't think he lost. Um, he's just acknowledging that he's not going to be in the White House anymore on January 21st. Uh, but yeah, he did not concede. He did not acknowledge that this was a free and fair election. And just to bring it back to James Langford, I think what's important here is that more Republicans need to be speaking out about the integrity of our democracy, uh, not just about, um, you know, trying to move on from uh, the lies. The, the whole thing was not true from the very beginning, and they knew that. And so it's time to tell people that this election was free and fair from the very beginning, and it's been proven and born out in the courts, uh, and more people need to say that, even if President Trump won't. Abby Phillip, thank you very much. As to those early designations, yeah. so the CDC never meant to be rigidly adhering to that, and in fact, they came out yesterday and the day before saying quite clearly, we didn't mean it to be a rigid adherence, be more flexible. Dr. Fetcher, well, I, have, I do want to ask you about this new study. Uh, overseas, a study of British healthcare workers, and it found uh, that folks with antibodies, according to the study, folks with antibodies could still carry and spread the virus. How, how worried should we be about our friends and family members who've already had COVID-19? Well, one of the things that we don't have enough information about, and we have to be humble and modest enough to, to really recognize and admit that, we do not know the duration of the durability of protection from yourself to get reinfected as well as spreading to others. We've got to be able to, and we are, doing studies to answer those kinds of questions. you still optimistic that we can get 100 million doses in 100 days? You know, I really do think so. I mean, we've discussed this with the Biden team, uh, and uh, we think it's quite feasible that we can do that. Right now, even now, we've gone from a half a million a day to 750,000 a day. I believe strongly that it's doable, and if we do it, stay on target to get the overwhelming majority of the country vaccinated. Uh, I have used that determination. I believe it's, it's, it's close to accurate, if not accurate. We have no way of knowing at this point that if we get about 70% to 85% of the people in the country vaccinated, we likely will get to that umbrella of herd immunity that you'll start to see a serious turnaround of infections so people can feel and i think it is possible after several months of doing this that we can start to approaching some form of normality but it's really going to be dependent on the uptake of vaccines which is the reason why we continually reach out to people to say please when vaccine becomes available get vaccinated, because we really want the overwhelming majority of the country to be vaccinated. Dr. Anthony Fauci on this Friday morning. Dr. Fauci, thanks as always, sir. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. All right, and coming up next, we are going to get you set for this weekend's epic matchup. It's an epic matchup for the ages. Or the it's age. a matchup for the middle ages, <laughs> okay? The first ever playoff showdown between NFL legends Tom Brady, Drew Brees, a combined 80-something years old. Five, baby. We'll hear from both stars right after this. <laughs> I'm David Kalaf. HIV to help you get to and stay undetectable. That's when the amount of viruses... And uh, a supplement. That's right. She tells the Washington Post, she said, 2,000 is 2,000, not 1,400. Your reaction? <laughs> well, you know, the... Never let a good crisis go to waste, so particularly in this environment, right? The, obviously, the Republican Party is on the heels right now. So, in a way, I was really surprised that Joe Biden didn't go for more. Ironically, the stock market is indicating it may open lower, so I might not be the only one who thought he might not have uh, added more to this. Uh, you know, listen, a, a lot of these things obviously will go through because of the nature of the crisis. Last Friday, we got a jobs report that was an unmitigated disaster. 500,000 leisure and hospitality jobs gone in a single month. But, but the problem here is I, there's so many 
things have nothing to do with the COVID-19 emergency, right? And, and that's where uh, the politics as usual come into play. If we are racing against the clock, if this is an emergency, you know, things I think will go through, obviously, is the additional $1,400. Uh, I, I think aid to open up schools, uh, which is sort of ironic because if they, they, they shouldn't have been, you know, closed right. in the first place to the degree they were. And, 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 but some of this other stuff, uh, you know, aid to these states and, 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 and localities where that they just mismanaged themselves for a long time, even prior to, to uh, last year, uh, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be some significant pushback. Charles, you're talking about the blue state bailout and what these states have tried to do in order to recoup the money they're losing in their pension funds and elsewhere is to tax their citizens. Well, that's led a lot of people to flee those states. And Fox Business recently had a headline saying that blue state exodus could flip the political map upside down, turning red states purple does that mean charles in your belief that even though they're fleeing one state they're taking the politics of the state they left and bringing it to the one they're going to there's no doubt about it you know and, and so with, with georgia for instance you could have seen that happening north carolina you saw that happening virginia being so close to dc and all the large just that is emanated out of that air you know it's so interesting though when you think that uh, you know let's say i lived in new york city uh, you know, we had the great migration of, of, of black Americans from the south to the north for the promise of greater economic uh, benefits, uh, more freedom and everything. And initially it worked out very well. Uh, you know, you, you had these jobs at the Ford Motor Plant and these things, blue collar jobs where you can send your kids to college. All of that stuff started going away and these local, these, these liberal states and cities tried to replace it with these, uh, these crazy schemes like higher taxes, more regulations that only made it harder for, for lower income or middle income folks to make it up the ladder. Right. A lot of them are throwing in the towel, they're moving elsewhere, but they're voting for the same people who, who won't give their kids a great education that they can compete and think they can make it up with higher minimum wage. They're voting for that same ideology. In fact, not just voting for it, but saying that this is this is our salvation. That this, like, for instance, Joe Biden was presented as, as a savior for many people. Uh, and, 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 and so it's, it's frustrating right. to say I'm going to go somewhere where there are opportunities, but I'm going to help change those opportunities yeah. by importing the stuff that uh, drove me and my family away in the first place. You know, and one of the things that uh, Joe Biden laid out last night from the Queen Theater there in Delaware is the fact that uh, the era of big government is back because he wants to give a lot of money to government. And that actually the topic uh, we had today with Robert Unanwe, and I've got to give you props. He's the CEO of Goya Foods. You had him on as a guest during your town hall the other day where he called it yeah. the iceberg of communism is ahead, and he told us all about it. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Payne, for helping us book our show. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, we are moving toward a collectivist society, uh, and, and there are just two things. Big government, which doesn't believe in you, the American, uh, and the ability of you, the American, to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, versus a, a different uh, ideology that believes small government, you do a few things, and you let us flourish. This is how we propelled to the top of the heap. We became the number one country in the world in a very short period of time. And, but there's still people who believe in the end of the ideology, and they do have the momentum. Yeah. So if you're going to be if you're going to be smart enough to leave a high tax state, don't be stupid enough to take those politics with you, or the same like thing that. will happen in that state. I like that. Charles, we're going to be watching you today, making money on the Fox Business Channel. There it is, right there. Week takes at 2 p.m. See you at 2 o'clock. Okay. See you too. Bye, Charles. Have a good weekend. All right. Janice is tracking this blizzard in the Midwest. Hey, Janice. Low pressure. Low pr a lot Hello. Of low pressure. Good morning. Our an area of low pressure. Exactly. We learned that today. An area of low pressure, meaning a storm system. This one is actually a blizzard, and it's because the criteria has it uh, that we're going to have a duration of time of wind sustained at 35 miles per hour or greater for a duration of three hours or more. So we're learning a lot about these blizzards. Uh, that's the criteria, and that's where we see the blizzard warning. So that's where we think the worst conditions are going to be. Blowing snow, uh, visibility reduced to nothing in some cases and very dangerous travel. So in the red areas, blizzard warnings. In the blue, that's a winter weather advisory. And then this system is going to move eastward and combined with another area of low pressure, a storm system off the coast. So the northeast is also going to get in on this action along the coast, mainly rain.
Guess what? Every American will be paying for that, their dialysis later on. It's the old Midas commercial. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. And right now, we have the least efficient health care system in the Western world. We can do it better. I agree with you. I understand you did that for a fact. I, no, 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 hold on. I knew you were going to do that for a fact, so let's all laugh. Okay? And now, Senator, since you know so much more about that than me, well, let's talk about, no, 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 on this, because you, you've worked your, your whole life on this. How do we do that? What, what should this Congress do? What should this look, president do to make that election? Two. Well, first of all, Joe, in order to bring everybody in and say that you're, we're all going to be eligible if you can prove that you're an American or here legally, which would be my requirement, uh, those of us who are entitled already to federal protection, whether it's the income tax deduction that tends to disproportionately favor individuals the higher their income goes, or whether it's people like myself that are eligible for subsidies as a consequence of getting blown up in a war, or whether you're eligible as a consequence of having a, a kidney that needs dialysis or eligible because you've reached a certain age. Uh, the worst program of all is, is, is Medicaid, in my view. It's completely un-American. You have to not only prove you're poor to be eligible for subsidies, you have to promise to remain poor. Because once you're no longer poor, you're no longer eligible. All right. Uh, this is... Been but in the way I want to go, it seems to me we all have to be willing to give up something. We're not going to get there. There you go. Conversation. Um, and thank you for that. Kurt, before uh, you go, uh, we want to mention your collaboration with Alec Baldwin on an upcoming audiobook. Here's a quick preview. You grant pardons just like granting wishes, like in Aladdin or Harry Potter or the Bible. Hasta la vista, America. Oh my God! America, farewell address, an audio book imagining the final speech by the president. The book is Evil Real Geniuses, quick. The Unmaking of America, a recent history. Kurt Anderson, thank you so much for being with us this week. And former Senator Bob Kerry, thank you. And as always, thank God for your service to America. Absolutely. We remain so grateful. Thank you very, very much. All right. Coming up in his first 100 days in office, President-elect Joe Biden has the lofty goal of administering 100 million coronavirus vaccines. Biden's pick to lead the Department of Health and Human Services, California Attorney General Javier Becerra joins us next to weigh in on that. Keep it right here on Morning Joe. Shingles. We will miss them. All right, focusing now on Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman, who could receive a Congressional Gold Medal for protecting senators from a mob of rioters at the U.S. Capitol last week. A bipartisan group of lawmakers introduced a bill saying Goodman deserves Congress's highest civilian honor for putting his life at risk to save them. Watch this video. This is the video of Officer Goodman. It shows him on social media with a crowd that he's luring away from the main entrance to the Senate floor after they chased him up the stairs. To the left of Officer Goodman, down that hallway, is exactly the halls of the Senate. Wow. The rioters followed him, where they were then met by a group of police officers. One of the lawmakers who introduced the bill said, Officer Goodman's heroics remind us all of what truly makes the United States great. Officer Goodman is a Iraq War veteran. He served in the 101st Airborne Division, Screaming Eagles, and the 18th Airborne Corps tweeted yesterday, Eugene was a hero long before. That is such a critical uh, moment in that doorway. Yes. That is really, I mean, it every is. time I look at it, it, I just kind of get chilled. Yeah. A few steps away, too. senators, yeah. and the other way. Okay. They're protected. And you know what, what else is interesting? The guy coming up the stairs, you can see him look down the hall like, what's back there? And he goes, ah, oh, nothing. I'll go this way. Mm -hmm. Spurred on by Officer Goodman, who sort of pushed he him. He pushed him to get him to follow him and down I'm the other way. Anthony, I can't get enough of that video and no. what he did. I in that moment. That medal. In that I hope moment. he gets that medal. Yes, we do. Okay. 
A Chinese restaurant in Montreal is getting attention for dishing out some brutal honesty on its menu. For the braised pork belly with sweet potato noodles, there is this pearl of wisdom. You may not want to have it every time if you're watching your weight. <laughs> Next Good. to the sweet and spicy pork strips, the owner writes, since I have such high expectations on this dish, I am not a huge fan of our version, <laughs> to be honest. That's so great. He gives this advice about ordering the orange beef. This one is not that good. Anyway, I'm not a big fan of North American Chinese food, and it's your call. <laughs> now it makes you want to try it. Oh, then the author of the restaurant, Aunt Dies, says those comments are on the menu because he'd rather not oversell the food. Uh, and we have a great tweet from Celeste Ng, who is a famous author. She yeah. writes yeah. this. This is amazing. This is like if your Asian mom decided to write food reviews, and I love it so incredibly much. Yeah. Don't you want to talk to him, Vlad? <laughs> oh, what, what an interesting guy. I, I love, like it. He actually doesn't like all the attention. He said, I don't want people thinking, oh, a lot of people are talking about this restaurant, so it must be very good. And then they come here and think, it's just average. It's just average. <laughs> to exercise. One of the things that kept coming up over and over again as I talked to neuroscientists and also traveled to communities around the world where dementia is really not a thing. They just don't have much of it. One thing you find is that people, you know, the humans weren't designed to either sit or lie for 23 hours a day and then get up and go to the gym for an hour a day. Uh, they were designed to be moving continuously. But even more to the point, people who, who did moderate movement, brisk walking as opposed to intense running, they tended to actually have more of these special factors known as neurotrophic factors, kind of like miracle growth for the brain, one neuroscientist explained to me, that are released when you are moving. Uh, it, it, it's fascinating stuff. You can't take this as a pill. You can't inject it. How do you stimulate new brain growth, new brain cell growth? Well, one of the best ways to do it is through moderate, uh, moderate levels of movement continuously throughout the day. It's almost like saying, hey, look, it's not that activity is the cure, it's more that inactivity is the disease. It's a mindset change, and, and that's what I try to reflect in the book. Oh my gosh, total music to my ears, because the exercise thing, you know, does make me feel guilty and bad when I can't do it, but, but you know, we can all do a walk, you know? We can all go for a walk, we can all do some sort of gentle yoga, as I do. Um, Sanjay, I think that you have a test for John and me that is going to grow our brains? Yes, I, and uh, let, me, let me set this up for a second, because I do find this really, really interesting. You know, we think about changing our bodies, even like changing your heart, and it takes months. You, know, you eat right, you exercise, you get the benefit over months. With your brain, things can happen quickly. And I think the biggest key thing that I'm about to show you is this idea that you want to use parts of your brain that you're not using that often. We use 10, 15% of our brain 80 to 90% of the time. If you start to recruit other parts of your brain into things, what you find is, A, you have new parts of your brain that you can draw on, you'll see patterns that you otherwise may have missed, you'll think more clearly, but it can also provide you some resilience against disease later on. So here's, here's an example. Allison, I, you know, if you can, John, actually, I'll have you start. If you could just take off your tie, which I know is very unusual for you. I've never seen you without a tie. But just go ahead and take off your tie. Most of the time, I don't even wear a shirt. Um, okay. He so. only wears a tie. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a different program. All right. Um, Allison, I, I don't know if you have, like, uh, lip gloss or, or lipstick or anything right close here. by. If, if you, if you, you're right-handed? No. I have, I'm, I'm right-handed, but I brought this with me so that you could test my brain, my lip gloss. All right, so take that, and you're going to try and put that on with your left hand. And at the same time, John, you're going to close your eyes, and you're going to go ahead and try and tie your tie back on with your eyes closed. I almost just dropped it. I feel like this is going to be so easy for me. Look, I am doing this. This is like second nature. I can't do it. No way I can do a double winder. So I'm just going to forget that. I don't even know what that is. Something Look at this. you do every day. I, I, my brain is so good right you're now. You're really good at that. Aren't I? You're really good at it. Actually, yes. Allison, you don't. You don't Actually, you don't need the book. Did I send you a book? You don't need that book. You can give it to someone else. <laughs> uh, what's but, happening over there, John? I'm dying what, my when tie. When you're doing this, what's happening is, John, you're doing pretty good. I'm done. <laughs> There's no harder to do now. Something you do every day, you're using your other senses to get this done, your sense of tactile, 
uh, you, you, you're, you're remembering, trying to remember a little bit of how you do this. It's all flipped around. Oh, oh, what? What, you, what you're doing there what? as you do this is you're using different parts of your brain to do something you haven't done before. Somehow that, uh, you know. Okay, and it's a scar. Nope, He's using it as a scar, basically, okay. at this point. I tried. Your brain needs help. That's what we've just learned, John, on national television. There's a nod here. Week, um, get new parts of your brain. It'll help you now and help protect your brain later. Sanjay, you're wonderful. The book is Sanjay. wonderful. It has so many good tips in here. Take a Good morning, Vanessa. The wind's still gusting, very high speeds out here. So as you commute to work this morning, be careful. If you're out on the Interstate I-29, take it just a little bit slower this morning. If you're out on the outstanding road on the outside of town, on the city, take it slow. It's still hard to see, even though it's the sun has come up. Visibility is still low, so be careful as you leave your house this morning. Aaron, how are things looking for the rest of the day? We are going to keep that wind around through the rest of today as well, Scott, and it'll finally start to ease up here as we head into the uh, evening hours. He mentioned the reduced visibility out there. Here is a look at the visibility right now. We have half a mile in uh, Worthington, one and a half miles at the airport here in Sioux Falls. So uh, the wind is causing blowing snow, obviously, and is causing some reduced visibility, especially out in rural areas. So if you do have to hit the roads, just make sure that you're giving yourself a little bit of extra time and being very cautious out there here this morning. Uh, we have a winter weather advisory in effect until 3 o'clock this afternoon for the county shaded in blue around the Sioux Falls area up towards and we have a uh, blizzard warning still in effect until 6 o'clock this evening. High wind warning in effect along and west of the James River until noon. That is uh, because we're going to have wind gusts of 45 to 55 miles per hour here as we go through the rest of today. Temperatures are going to be holding pretty steady. We're in the upper 20s and low 30s right now. And, and we're going to be in the upper 20s and low 30s here through the rest of today. But the wind will die down from west to east across the region this evening and into tonight. Wind should not be an issue. And I pack it with my 60-day money they're on the ground and so I think what we have is someone who's not only very experienced but very committed to get this done by being straight relying on facts in this case on COVID relying on science and getting the best minds out there to help us but no doubt you need a good leader and that's where president like Biden comes in new sheriff in town come, you know, uh, January 20th yeah you know Javier uh, I, I loved working in the house with you and I always found you were a person of uh, good faith and uh you know you you're also easy to you know talk to easy to work with like you 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 didn't judge anybody based on their views or their political party i'm just wondering with your experience on capitol hill and with joe biden's experience on capitol hill uh, the very thing that people have been trying to run away from experience people who actually know how to make washington work people who actually have relationships in washington how much do you think that's going to help you do your job uh, and allow you to work with the republicans to work with democrats work with everybody joe and you know we have different views on some things and we don't always win but what we know is we got to move the ball forward because at the end of the day there are 320 million people who depend on us and so i think with Joe Biden as president and those of us who have experience in the Congress, we're going to try to move the ball. It's not about philosophy. It's not about winning. It's about moving the ball forward. That's what we need for this country right now. Amen. California Attorney General Javier Becerra, thank you so much for being on, ending on a hopeful note this morning. Thank you. All right. Uh, that does it for us this morning. What a week it's been. Uh, next week, be sure to be tuning in to Morning Joe. We'll be following it all. Stephanie Rule picks up the coverage right now. Hi there. I'm Stephanie Rule. It is Friday, January 15th, and this morning, our nation's capital is on lockdown. Fears that right-wing extremists, American extremists, could attack D.C. and state capitals in the days ahead. They are testing law enforcement in ways we have not seen in decades. In fact, NBC News has just learned that a rehearsal for Joe Biden's inauguration was pushed back from Sunday to Monday because of security concerns. Take a look at these scenes straight out of a fictional war movie. Thousands of National Guard troops pouring into Washington with 21,000 expected to be there by inauguration day. Those troops will be armed and authorized to use deadly force. In other words, the inauguration, which is traditionally considered a giant celebration of our nation, is going to look more like an armed camp. The National Mall could be shut down. Downtown train stations and parking garages will be closed. 
And if you were inside the inauguration perimeter, expect to be stopped and questioned. FBI Director Chris Ray explained the show of force when he met with Vice President Pence last night. We are seeing an extensive amount uh, of concerning online chatter, I guess the best way I would describe it, about a number of events surrounding the inauguration. We've got to disrupt uh, any attempt or, or attack. Our posture is aggressive. Uh, it's going to stay that way through the inauguration. According to NBC, that chatter includes calls for violence against government officials and advance on making and concealing homemade weapons. But there is a reason to hope that the massive security response may work and prevent attacks on the inauguration. Experts tell the Washington Post that some extremist leaders are calling for followers to hold off on traveling to D.C. next week, but that is raising concerns that extremists may simply go after federal buildings in their home states. To protect against that, states of emergency have been declared in Virginia, New Mexico, and Utah. Additional security is in place in places like Ohio and Michigan, and the governors of Kentucky and California are bringing in the National Guard to help secure their capitals. This... Thank you, families, as well. I know you all had to mob out to get here, and uh, being here at the Capitol, providing the level of security that's going to make it possible for us to have uh, a uh, historic transfer of power. The thousands and thousands of uh, men and women in uniform that are going to make it possible for us to uh, have a safe inauguration. 21,000 National Guard have been called up for the inauguration. About 7,000 are here now. Their rules of engagement very different than a week ago. Those who were part of the mob inside the Capitol last week have been charged with multiple federal crimes. We've already identified over 200 suspects. So we know who you are if you're out there, uh, and FBI agents are coming to find you. Federal authorities are preparing for the possibility of a mass casualty event, just in case. Well, if there were a major event there, this unit can, can do high, very high level, high skilled uh, search and rescue, both from confined spaces, high angle search and rescue, but also they can do it in a chemical, biological, nuclear environment. That from the head of the Ohio National Guard. What has Pentagon officials and senior U.S. military commanders very concerned is that they have seen the images of uh, many veterans who, have, who are highly trained uh, in military training who were part of the crowd. Some of them breached the Capitol. Some have been charged. At least one was charged. He was a uh, state policeman from Virginia who was an active duty National Guardsman. That has uh, military officials concerned and they have put out letters to the force saying as much and calling uh, for calm and telling uh, members of the U.S. military to follow the law. Back to you. Thank you, Jennifer Griffin, live at our nation's capital. Jennifer, thank you. John? And it's not just in D.C. A lot of states are stepping up security ahead of Wednesday's inauguration. California Governor Gavin Newsom calls in the National Guard to help protect the state capitol and other government buildings. Workers are installing fencing around the Capitol building in Sacramento. And on the East Coast, crews are adding concrete barriers around the state Capitol building in New York, in Albany. And for more on all this, let's bring in Bill McGurn, Wall Street Journal, Main Street columnist, former speechwriter to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Bill, good morning to you. It's really something for all of us, for, for the American people to see the added security measures that are happening in Washington just to secure the inauguration, 20,000 troops in our nation's capital. What do you think when you see that? Uh, well, I think it's a little bit sad. It's, it's, a, it's a public ceremony uh, for the United States. It's very important, so it's sad to see a lot of these troops there and so forth. But um, I think the best hope is that it's unnecessary, right? I think after the violence we saw last time, the last thing we need is more violence this time. And one of the problems, one of the problems last Wednesday, I believe, was just the lack of manpower. I mean, when you're facing huge crowds, it, it just looked like the Capitol Police did not have enough officers to discourage people from even thinking about, you know, overwhelming a barrier or something. So I'm hoping it's all unnecessary. 
and we'll be better off. The main thing is not to allow any repeat of last week. So I think they have to do what they have to do. Meanwhile, Miranda Devine in her piece in the New York Post this morning is writing about what she calls the left's bare-faced hypocrisy bill. She says House Democrats believe in a peaceful transition power at least this time as opposed to 2016. They believe in walls at least when it comes to protecting their own place of work. They even believe in bringing in the National Guard to quell civil unrest. At least when it comes to preserving their own peace. We learned that they almost to a man and to a man and a woman suffer from an acute case of hypocrite-itis bill, she writes. <laughs> Well, there's never any shortage of hypocrisy in, uh, in our nation's capital. I, I think she's absolutely right. Uh, it doesn't really change anything. The problem with these kind of arguments is that, I mean, right now the focus has to be on peace. And the, the flip side of that argument is that those of us who have no tolerance for anyone uh, caught in any act of violence now have to be consistent and condemn it. Um, you know, from the Trump side when we see it. But uh, I don't think that's too hard because I don't think most Trump supporters, the peaceful ones, have any issue with prosecuting people who broke into the Capitol or broke a window or came or did any other violent act. So, um, uh, but she's absolutely right. This was not the, the zero tolerance um, idea or, or Joe Biden's idea that these are domestic terrorists because what we didn't hear that language, you know, when Portland or Seattle was burning. We heard about a summer of love. To that focus on peace that you're talking about there, Bill, Dan Bongino was talking about that on Hannity last night. Listen. If we can't live and agree that we can dispute tax rates and health care policy, and that's fine, but there's a meeting in the middle with these both parties. We will not normalize political violence ever. We'll have our elections, we'll do our thing, but we won't ever normalize. But if we could just agree on that one rule, everything would be just peachy going forward. But we can't even agree on that. Will we eventually be able to, Bill? I hope so. Uh, you know, I hope as as time passes and so forth, we get a little more perspective. But I but I do agree that in addition to the violence, some of the hypocrisy we're seeing from uh, Democratic leaders is going to leave very very bad feelings because there seems to be an effort now, not only to say I don't like anything Donald Trump did, I disagree with his uh, tax cuts, his deregulation, his foreign policy. But an effort to kind of demonize all his followers, as though like the QAnon shaman is representative of uh, the 74 million Trump voters. And if we continue down that path, we're not going to have the healing that the, that the president-elect is right to say we need. Really interesting. The Wall Street Journal editorial board takes on Nancy Pelosi this morning and her power grab, writing Pelosi's top priority, consolidating power of her first bills in the new Congress would dilute ballot integrity and make D.C. a state. To that point, Bill, uh, when you dig into that piece, it's highlighting the fact that that appears to be the priority for Nancy Pelosi and members of her own caucus rather than focusing on the problems at hand, and that is getting people back to work, and that is uh, bringing an end to this pandemic that is causing so much struggle and pain in this country. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's not surprising that a Democratic leader of the House would want to expand uh, the Democratic members of the House, Democratic governors, Democratic senators, and a Democratic president. But um, we're fiddling with the, uh, the rules. And in fact, this is one of the areas, like a lot of the people who believe that the election was stolen, I'm not sure they're looking in the right place. I don't, I don't think those, those theories about what happened on election day. I think the bigger problem is, and one of the things that, that has uh, eroded confidence, is that we changed election day to like election month, and um, they did all sorts of things doing away with um, requirements to verify certain mail-in ballots. Like a lot of this was done beforehand. Um, and I, th I think people need to have confidence in the system and have a system. I personally, I don't know if we can get the genie back in the bottle, but I'm old-fashioned. I believe in election day that you vote unless you have a very good reason that you can't come that day and that we should get the results as soon as possible, hopefully that night. So uh, this is going to be a battle. Uh, Mrs. Pelosi has shown what her priorities are. All right, Bill McGurn, always good to talk with you. Thanks for kicking things off on this Friday morning. Thanks, Bill. Back to the Capitol riot investigation now. The FBI says more arrests could come soon. 
Will the most serious charges stick? Tom Dupree is an attorney and former deputy assistant attorney general. Um, Tom, the fella in that picture who we just saw uh, there, Adam Christian Johnson is his name. He has been arrested, charged with theft of government property, um, one count of violent entry and disorderly conduct on capital grounds, and charged with one count of knowingly entering or remaining in any restricted building or grounds. His lawyer uh, has a comment on, well, that what appears to be photographic evidence of the crimes. Listen. Obviously, that presents problems for you as a defense attorney in that you have your client in the building at the time of the uh, break-in, shall yeah, we say. I, yeah, I, I don't know the, you know how to else explain that, but yeah, that's, that's, that would be a problem. Not a magician, and neither is a victim. So yeah, we've got a photograph of our client who appears to be inside the federal building or inside the Capitol with the government problem. Is this a case, Tom, that uh, screams plea agreement? <laughs> well, I think certainly to some of those lesser charges, I would say yes, right? If your client is captured on a photograph or video being unlawfully present in the Capitol, it's hard to defend that. So I think what we will see in a lot of these cases is plea agreements as to some of the lesser charges, such as unlawful entry. Now, if you have cases where individuals are being charged with more serious crimes, assault and battery, potentially sedition, there, I suspect you might see the defense attorneys try to mount a defense because charges of that nature can't always be captured with photographic evidence. And we still don't have any charges yet in the in the death of the Capitol Hill police officer who apparently was hit in the head maybe multiple times with a fire extinguisher. Um, obviously, they're taking their tr time trying to nail that down, and and that the charges like those um, could even carry a federal death penalty, I suppose. They could. Um, certainly, if you're attacking and murdering federal officers, uh, if you're committing a murder or if a murder or death occurs in the course of commission of a, a felony, all of those things potentially could lead to the death penalty. I suspect what law enforcement is doing in this case is that they are going to arrest and begin prosecution against many of these individuals on these low-level charges, such as unlawful entry. And then if evidence surfaces implicating them in, say, the murder of a federal law enforcement official, those more serious charges will later be added and prosecuted. And I suppose it's a case where... ...that from the very beginning, there was a movement to stop everything he was trying to do. Um, and that it is absolutely true that the broader mainstream media it has, a, has a progressive bent and, and, and hated him from the start. Um, and my view as a Republican, I've been in communications and I, and I feel dealt with what I consider a, a left-leaning media um, for a long time, um, is to just say, okay, well, that's just reality and I'm going to have to work a little harder and be a little better. Um, and maybe it shouldn't be that, that simple or fair. Um, but, you know, I don't think... There are two tracks on the back of the snow. Likes and giving him a great deal of pride. You made me smile, and you made me smile, too. Sending it back to you in the studio. That was just great. Thanks, Lara. We're going to move on now to our GMA cover story, encouraging news from Jeff Bridges. The Oscar has revealed that the cancer treatment he's receiving has, quote, drastically shrunk his tumor. Will Reeve has the details. Good morning, Will. Good morning, George. This is what we love to hear. If you're looking for something, anything, to make you smile on this Friday, the dude abides. This morning, good news from actor Jeff Bridges in an update on his battle with lymphoma. The 71-year-old sharing in an online journal that his cancerous tumor appears to have drastically shrunk since his last CAT scan, writing, I go in for a CAT scan to see if my new protocol is shrinking the tumor. Turns out it's working beautifully. The thing has drastically shrunk. Nobody calls me Lebowski. You got the wrong guy. I'm the dude, man. Known for his iconic roles in films including The Big Lebowski, Crazy Heart, and True Grit. What do you want, girl? We've got the trouble down. Bridges first revealed his diagnosis last October. Lymphoma is a type of blood cancer that develops in the lymphatic system, a vital part of the body's disease-fighting network. The cancer can occur in both adults and children. According to the American Cancer Society, lymphoma is one of the most common cancers in the U.S., accounting for about 4% of all cancers. Chances of developing lymphoma are about 1 in 41 for men and 1 in 52 for women. After shaving his head and beginning treatment, the dude has remained vocal about his battle, posting about it regularly on social media. 
flashing a big smile on his 71st birthday with his new puppy Monty, ringing in the new year with his wife, and even grabbing his guitar and singing an original tune. With the phrase, all in this together, inscribed on his instrument. So In a previous journal entry, Bridges said he was feeling all the love from his fans, writing, quote, It's contagious, all this love, like some kind of positive virus. I want to acknowledge and thank you guys for reaching out at this time. Our thoughts are with Jeff Bridges. George Sherrill. Sure, okay, well, thanks very much. Let's bring in Dr. Jen Ashton for more on this tumor's drastically shrunk. This has to be great news. It is, George, and we have to remember that there is always reason for optimism, especially when you're talking about the world of oncology and cancer. But the awareness is key because, as Will said, this only represents about 4% of all cancers in the U.S., so people do need to be kind of aware of what the symptoms are. They're vague, um, but they can include enlarged lymph nodes, generally in the neck or armpit or groin, fevers, night sweats unintentional weight loss. Of course, you can have many of these things and not have lymphoma, but when a celebrity like Jeff Bridges comes forward like this, it does so much to increase awareness. Yeah, we don't know exactly what kind of lymphoma he has, but what are the treatments out there? Well, again, it depends on what type of lymphoma. It depends on the age of the patient, the stage of the lymphoma, but in general, you're talking about chemotherapy, radiation, some targeted therapies, um, but these can all be incredibly effective and again, we follow it a number of ways, sometimes with blood tests, but really the, the classic is with imaging studies like CAT scans. When we see tumors getting smaller, that's what we want to see. Exactly what we want to see. We're so happy for him. Jen, thanks very much. You bet. Okay, George, we're going to turn now to our series, Sweet Dreams. It's all about... Well, we're back to start today in a story from Carson we have been waiting all week to hear. Yeah, all, all week you've been raving about the uh, Star Peloton instructor Alex Toussaint. He motivates thousands of loyal followers every day, yourself included. That is right, guys. As you know, I recently took AT's class. It's a tough workout, but it's about so much more than working out. Alex has this incredible gift to reach right into your heart and soul. He always says, validate your greatness. And this morning, it's time that we validate his. AT's in the house, man. It's so good to see you. I have to just thank you so much, man. You saved uh, so many of us from unnecessary bad days. I mean, it's been a crazy 10 months, man. Well, you yeah. are the constant. Lock and load. This ain't daycare. Activate, baby. Alex is a Peloton icon. Come on, Peloton. Final 30 seconds, baby. He says it's not a job, but a calling inspiring tens of thousands of riders. Talk to people at home like we're in class right now and give them, the people, some optimism in 2021. If you want to move different in 21, you have to think different. You have to surround yourself with different. But his journey to this moment wasn't a straight path, and it wasn't easy. Raised by Haitian immigrants and a strict father who sent him off to military school to get in line. So I had a real just troubled childhood growing up, finding myself in and out of school, a tough mental state as a kid. My father's a very regimented, strict kind of dude. He uh, thought the best way to save my life so I don't end up a statistic or in jail was to send me to military school, give me the opportunity to have discipline at a young age in life. What was it like when you had the first chance to tell your dad what you just said to me? All right, I cried. My entire life, I really been searching for my father's validation until I had the opportunity to make it to Peloton. April 4th, 2015, 4.30 in the afternoon, I got that phone call from my dad saying, I'm proud of you. And I'll never wow. forget that, because as a young black man, I've lived my entire life searching for that validation. Let's go. <laughs> no, let's go. You know the date, the time. Yeah, I love it, man. For me, that was the day that I stopped existing in life and then started living in life. It's incredible. I love it. And people who are watching this right now, this is what you do. This is, a, you know, a microcosm of what it's like to take one of your rides, your class. Absolutely. It's much more than a ride. It's a journey. Yeah. Walk us through a journey in life. Like I said, how you view yourself is how you treat yourself, Peloton. The pandemic is disproportionately hurting people of color. I mean, mm -hmm. what do you do with all that energy? In all honesty, Carson, this has been my therapy, too. Provide light at a time that I had pure darkness. It's hard to believe that just seven years ago, Alex was mopping floors at a gym and asked for a shot to teach a class. I went from mopping floors one day to teaching. The next day, the next thing I knew, I went. And then Peloton called to recruit me. 
They start liking me like if you like my stuff. I just want to pull the light out of people. You hear me say class. I would say activate your base. It just may take somebody to believe in you for you to believe in yourself. Wow. So most people probably think you take a Peloton ride, you know, to lose weight or whatever. I mean, what got me into it, I'm, I'm over 650 rides. 99.9% .9 are all yours. And it's not that I'm first, you're just going to try to overlook that. It's like, don't overlook that. You better validate that. Like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm validating myself. But, you know, a lot of my rides, you know, I've, I've, I have a history of anxiety and panic disorder. And, you know, for my mentals, you know, that's a big reason that I go there. You're looking right at us. You're looking right into our hearts and our souls. Your responsibility on the bike way transcends dropping some LBs. Physically is one thing, but internally are we okay? And that was my model coming into every single class. Like, you're dealing with anxiety. You see that members are going through something life-changing and are reaching out to me for advice, for inspiration, for life, for courage. And I'm... For me, it's like, I need to show up. If you're watching this, if you're moving today, you woke up, you blessed. You're ultimately winning. But if you want the Alex Tucson from my class, yo, you got 24 hours to get, get you out of, out of the saddle, let's work. You know, let's go. Around. It ain't daycare, baby, it's game time. If you have I'm going, man, I'm going right now. I'm going right now. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> no, but in all honesty, Carson, it lets me know that everything that I show in life paid off for a reason. You let the rhythm guide you, let the flow just guide you. His strength is also his taste in music. And Alex let me help DJ a playlist for the ride. Great suggestions you sent over to When I saw that coming through, I said, oh, that's my man. That's my brother for sure. We're going to turn that up. Once again, 30 Minute Hit Rock brought to you by my brother Carson Daly and myself. Hope y'all ready for this playlist. Because your playlists are always on point. That song, you're like, all right, here we go. It's got that bounce to it. It's like, here we go. Like, all right, we're going to do this ride, man. Are you ready? I'm ready, brother. You ready? My dog Carson, you ready, baby? Let's go. Let's go. Lock and load, lock and load. Come on, Carson. Man, I was eight, nine, ten years old running home to watch TRL. This is a TRL classic right here. Let's go, Bridge. Carson, I see you, baby. I'm tired. That's why I'm looking down, Alex. I'm hanging on. Carson, validate, baby. Let's go. Validation. I'm tired. You thought you, 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 thought you was done? Now it's time to show out, baby. Come on. Last song. Thank you, Jesus. Five, come on. Five, four, three, two. Hey. 30-minute hit ride to the complete today. Perfect step by. AT, one love, man. Thank you. I just want to make my mama proud. I just want to make my parents proud. So wherever that direction takes me, I'm there for it. Well, there you go, and I get it. You know, maybe you don't can't afford a Peloton, you don't have room for one. It's really not just about Peloton. The truth is, I don't just love Alex. I need Alex. And until I was willing to, you know, open myself up to like you know, reaching into a community, in this case it's Peloton, but I urge people to find your own version of Alex. Find your own thing in your life that pushes you out of your own comfort zone. As Alex says, this isn't daycare. I have my I'm so impressed. Yeah. You're motivating me. I'm just pumped. I'm so glad we could do that. Thank you to Yael. Our producer did a great job with it. But I, again, man, this is about, you know, people's mentals too. And like, it, it, maybe maybe your version of Alex is, is seeking mm -hmm. therapy, being more communicative with your own family members. Like, stop suffering in silence, which I've done my whole life. You know, I, I, I need Alex. I need yeah. that. Find what you need and push yourself to find the happiness. Folks can also, by the way, who are Pelotoners, they can enjoy your ride with Alex as well. They can get on it. As the kids say, lit. It was lit. <laughs> it was. It was so fun. It ain't dead. Oh, by the way, yeah. So right when my ride ended, yeah. we rolled on this. This wasn't, look, this is the, how it is in the daily household. Siri walks in with brownies. <laughs> <laughs> That's I just up. kill myself on the bike and then my... My wife, who's an incredible cook, is like, here's some fresh brownies. I mean, <laughs> that's why I look the way I look. Oh, my gosh. It's love. Yeah, love. it is love. So thanks, Bingo. You know what? You need all the things for mental health, right? Uh, AT, thank you, sir. That was Love awesome. Brother. Thank you, Carson. Now, what you got in the forecast? All right. Well, we just got the uh, 2020 global climate outlook for this last past year. Second hottest year globally on the planet. And the last seven years have been the hottest seven years. As we drill down into the United States, this is the fifth warmest year on record. And in fact, you take a look at this, and this really makes sense. The drought area in this country has increased by five hundred percent so 2020 was literally a year we were on fire that's what's going on around the country here's what's happening in your neck of the woods 
The wind is still howling out there across the region. It's going to continue here as we head through the rest of today. We have winter weather advisory in effect until 3 o'clock here in the southeast and a blizzard warning in effect for eastern parts of the region until 6 o'clock. High wind warnings in effect for uh, along the west of the James River until noon. So we're going to see wind gusts in between 45 and 55 miles an hour, causing some blowing snow and reduced visibility, especially in eastern parts of the region. All that goes away here as we head into the weekend with highs in the mid to upper 20s and low 30s. Slight chance for a few flurries coming our way on Monday. These that in your questions, get your answers. What you need to know about the COVID-19 vaccine. Join us for an Inside Kelloland Health Beat Special, the COVID-19 vaccine. Two chances to watch Sunday night at 1030 and Monday night at 630, only on Kelloland TV. So far for less and get history, uh, you know, and I think lots of people are very, very distressed and upset that there was such misinformation. Uh, you know, people told that the election was stolen uh, despite the fact that there was no evidence, despite the courts, the attorney general, the cyber command saying no evidence of any fraud in this election. Uh, and then people were saying, well, who perpetrated this? And then who in the Congress actually was willing to vote to block certification of Biden's election? And I think you're seeing those repercussions. And I understand why conservatives might say, oh, don't silence conservatives, you're punishing, this is like the scarlet letter. But I think in this moment, people are saying this was outrageous. Well, and just remember, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. That, that comes to mind too. Juan Williams, <laughs> David Avella, thank you both. Thank you, gentlemen. After campaigning for president, Andrew Yang now says he's going to run for New York City mayor. Wait till you hear how he plans to fix the problems facing the Big Apple. Plus, President-elect Joe Biden laying out priorities for his first 100 days in office, and it does not come with a cheap price tag. So who's going to pay for all this? Duvarney joins us next. I've pricked my finger too many times. My that has been growing on U.S. soil for years. According to current and former counter-terror officials, the threat now rivals that from international terrorism. There is no debate. The facts show uh, that right-wing extremists have killed more people since 9-11 than any other political ideology, uh, and that includes jihadi terrorists. Since 9-11, 114 people have been killed in attacks by far-right-wing terrorists in the United States. 107 by jihadist terrorists. And right-wing attacks are increasingly outpacing jihadi terrorism, responsible for two-thirds of attacks and plots in the U.S. in 2019, and more than 90 percent between January 1st and May 8th, 2020. Attacks and plots by such groups have now occurred in 42 states and the District of Columbia in the past six years. Fueling right-wing extremists are the conspiracies propagated by the president, of a system organized against them, and two essential ingredients. The first is a leader who tells them what to do, who tells them how to feel, who sort of makes them, makes them believe that they are part of something bigger, right? That this is a mission. The other is a network, whether it's social media or a platform or ways of communication, that lets them essentially talk amongst themselves, right? Get organized. The growing degree of organization particularly alarms U.S. officials. Investigators are pursuing signs the assault on the Capitol was planned and not spontaneous, including knowledge of the Capitol's layout, radio communications among protest leaders, and planting of explosive devices to divert law enforcement. The worry now is that the targets could expand along with the planning, from the U.S. Capitol to all 50 state capitals, to so-called soft targets, mirroring those attacked by jihadi terrorists. Infrastructure, hitting soft targets, a disruption of services, those are the sorts of things that every systemically important infrastructure uh, owner, operator, CEOs, needs to be assembling their crisis management teams yesterday. Fact is, the FBI and Justice Department have been warning about right-wing extremism for years, and the DHS now identifies it as, quote, the most persistent and lethal threat in the homeland. However, political appointees in the Trump administration at times downplayed it. The political signals have been that, that right-wing terrorism is sort of 
okay. That's not what the president said at Charlottesville, after the Charlottesville uh, terrorist attack. Um, and he continues to some degree. Downplaying the threat and even echoing extremist rhetoric. Our country will be destroyed and we're not going to stand for that. That has had consequences. The failure to identify it, to name it, and to focus resources on the growing threat of white supremacy terrorism has meant that agencies have not focused on it in the way that they should. January 6th laid that vulnerability bare. Despite weeks of chatter online, U.S. authorities were not prepared for a deadly assault in the heart of the U.S. Capitol. One measure of the seriousness of the threat now for the inauguration, there will be more than 20,000 National Guardsmen in Washington, D.C., many of them armed. That is nearly four times the number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria combined. Poppy? It is stunning. That is such a good report, Jim. Thank you very much. Let's talk more about what is being threatened on a state level. Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman is here. Good morning to you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. And let me just begin with what just crossed, and that is that federal prosecutors are now saying in a new court filing this morning that the intention, uh, at least among some who led that riot, that insurrection at the Capitol, was to, quote, capture and to assassinate elected officials. Knowing that and knowing that they feel emboldened from what they did last week, what are you preparing for at the Pennsylvania State Capitol? Well, I mean, we definitely uh, completely reviewed our, our security protocols and, and made a, a lot of different changes. Of course, I can't go into detail with them. Yeah. But what I can say is, is that on Tuesday, when I was in the Capitol presiding over the Senate, uh, or excuse me, Wednesday, there were uh, National Guardsmen with automatic weapons that were patrolling the area. And there is a very different climate there than there certainly was just a week earlier before the attacks in the Capitol. And the, the governor just announced, too, that he is shutting down the Capitol complex for the, the, the entire week just to make sure that there isn't you know, any kind of actions like that taken. You know, take a look at this. This is video. Um, it's really hard to watch, but our, I think it's important for our viewers to see of a Pennsylvania man who is also a retired firefighter, Robert Sanford, arrested yesterday on four federal charges, accused of throwing a fire extinguisher. This is a retired fireman. Look at that, hitting the heads of three police officers there. You've got another Pennsylvania resident federally charged this week for his alleged role in, in the riot as well. I, I suppose I wonder your message to anyone who may be planning any form of violence at the state capitol or anywhere in your state leading up to the inauguration. Well, obviously, they condemn it in the strongest possible terms. But what's given rise to this, in my estimation, is the months and months and weeks and weeks of unanswered tweets and conspiracy theories and right. lies and outrage. And it's the logical conclusion when all of that goes unchecked until just very recently when he was shut down. The idea that you have unlimited free speech to advance lies that are demonstrably false is yelling fire in a crowded theater when there is none. Sure, and it's interesting because overnight we learned that the, the president's sort of response here is going to be that he's protected by, by free speech. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to, to the judiciary, and obviously it'll be debated in the Senate trial. But you um, really took interest in the great interview that Jim just did with Congressman Andy Barr of, of Kentucky. And his argument is against the, the president being deplatformed, if you will, taken off Twitter, against Parler being taken off Amazon, despite their repeated warnings about the violent content. Uh, can you explain your case? Because I think it's interesting from a Democratic perspective. It sounds like you don't think Twitter made the right decision by taking the platform off, taking the president off the platform. Is that right? Yeah, well, from the, from the very beginning after the election, the, you know, no state has received more scorn and conspiracies and lies than Pennsylvania had. And it is all demonstrably false. Seven million votes. We had three documented cases of voter fraud, and they all were for the president, I might add. So this idea that saying that Pennsylvania was rigged or that we were trying to steal the election, unquote, that's a lie. And that you do not have the right. That is not protected speech. The second those tweets went up, they should have been deleted. That's not deplatforming someone. It's, it's deleting lies that are yelling fire in a crowded theater when there is none. 
And there's a difference. That is not protected speech. He can talk all day about what his favorite football team is or that he's the greatest president in the history of the world. But no one, Republican, Democrat, whatever, has the right to say those kind of incendiary lies that are hurled with only one goal in mind, and that is to damage and debase the Democratic franchise. And that is exactly what happened. Slapping the this is in dispute is, is, is ineffectual. It, it, it's not dispute. If, if I say one plus one equals three, that's not in dispute. You know, it wasn't dispute that Pennsylvania re results were true. You know, it was demonstrably false. And we had a perfect election in the sense that we had no instances other than those three. You cannot use a private platform to deliberately spread what you know are lies to cause harm and to incite violence and mass chaos. And that's exactly what Twitter allowed up to recently when they deplatformed him altogether. And then you think they went too far by deplatforming him? All I'm saying, though, is that anyone should have, should have never gotten to that point, is that, is that you were slapping a warning on a tweet and allowing it to be retweeted millions of times and have it spread over I and think, over again. Yeah, too little, too late. I think it's such an important debate um, that we need to have, and, and, and it's, it's almost as if, you know, well, we were as, as a country and these platforms grappling with it in real time. So the hope is that this leads to some very clear rules and regulations going forward all around. Thank, thank you for the time and good luck. I hope everyone is safe in your state. Thank you. Thank you very much. President Elect been calling President Trump's COVID-19 vaccine rollout a, quote, dismal failure. You're going to learn his goal for the first 100 days in office in terms of vaccine distribution next. When? FOIA, because more important to her now. Buddy, We're very excited. That looked like our family, that looked like my daughter's. You know, we would um, sometimes color the skin color in with the brown marker. I learned that, you know, 2018, it's something like there were more books that had animals as main characters than there were books that had black, Latinx, indigenous, Asian, human characters combined, combined were just not represented on the pages of books. And I, I wanted to do something about that. And I sort of, you know, said, I'm just gonna write the book myself, right? Ambitious Girl is Harris's second children's book. When a young girl sees a strong woman labeled on TV as too assertive and too ambitious, it sends her on a journey to reclaim words meant to knock her down, a concept passed through generations of Harris women. My grandmother had the saying that Kamala talks about a lot, which is you may be the first to do many things, but I will not be the last. I was told that I could do anything, that I could be anything, and I was taught that you know ambition meant purpose, it meant determination, it meant having a dream and a vision and going after it and not letting anyone get in your way. <laughs> It's so impressive to hear that history, but I know one of your favorite stories had to do with when she was a little girl. Yeah, I love that from the time she was a little girl, she was ambitious. She actually went with her mom because her mom was a teen mom to all of her classes at Stanford, stood in line and introduced her mother to her current husband by asking him to play hide and go seek. Wow, <laughs> that's a story, that's a cute. That's another fairy tale I, to I tell. I the inside to this family of strong women. It was pretty cool. All right, Jenna, thank you so much. Again, the book is called Ambitious Girl. We're going to have more of the conversation with her Tuesday on your show, yes. Oda and Jenna. Awesome. All right, guys, back to you. All right, guys, thanks so much. When we come back, we got the great Liam Neeson on the program. We're going to talk to him about his action-packed new movie, The Marksman, other films that make him so beloved in Hollywood. We may have to do a little geeking out on an exploration about Star Wars. All of it coming up with Liam Neeson at first. This is Today on NBC. I just feel like and cilantro just kind of go hand in hand. You've got a dry spice and then you've got a beautiful fresh spice. So you can just go ahead and sear that, throw all the vegetables in, let them just start with you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sandra. Thanks, Thanks so much for being with us. We'll be. A federal judge indicating she will make a quick decision on Parler's suit against Amazon for shutting it down online. This, as a Wall Street Journal op-ed, observes that corporate America has taken a sharp left turn when it comes to politics. Plus a New Jersey gym that is defying orders to close during the coronavirus lockdown accuses the state of emptying its bank account. The owner of that gym on his fight to survive, coming up. Okay. 
Kristen, thank you. Joining us now, Jonathan Capehart, Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post opinion writer and host of the Sunday show here on MSNBC, and David Brooks, New York Times op-ed columnist. You can catch both of them every Friday night on PBS NewsHour for their aptly named weekly segment, Brooks and Capehart. Uh, gentlemen, let's get right into it. Jonathan, to you. Your take on impeachment and how it should play out. And I don't mean like pie in the sky, ideally, like really how. Well, one, uh, President Donald Trump should have been impeached, deserved to be impeached, and I'm glad he has been impeached. Uh, as to your question about what should happen in an ideal world, I I'm going to defy you, Stephanie. If I'm pie in the sky, then I'm going to get real pie in the sky. He should be tried, convicted, um, an asterisk, yet another one put next to his name, and then um, prevented from running, <clears throat> excuse me, prevented from running for public office ever again. The problem, though, is one, getting a Senate in the Senate trial, getting 17 Republicans to provide the six, seven votes needed to convict him. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. The one silver lining is that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has left it hanging out there that he could possibly vote to convict. And if anything, David and I both know, and you know this, Stephanie, as well, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell doesn't say or telegraph anything that he doesn't want said or telegraphed. Mitch McConnell is one strategic beast. David, what do you think? Well, I think he should be impeached. I'm glad he was impeached. I think he should be convicted. I think there's almost no chance he will be convicted. They have to get 17 Republican senators. Mitch McConnell would have to bring along a lot of people. I've been looking, talking to Republicans and looking at the sermons in the white church around the country this week. They are not bailing on Donald Trump. They are bailing on the deranged lunatics who did the campus mob. A lot of pro-Trump people are saying, what have we become? And so what you see in pulpits across the country and in conservative homes are these intense and angry battles over what the Republican Party has become. And they're not angry at Trump, but they do realize there's a cancer of derangement of people who have simply left reality. And a lot of people who are still in the reality community who might be quite conservative are appalled and they want to do something about that. So the conflict isn't really over Trump, it's about reality and anger at violence and so that's where the part the strife within the conservative movement is right now i'd say but jonathan Joe Biden last night. This package will take us to full employment by 2021, one full year earlier than it would occur without 2021 versus 2022, one full year earlier. <clears throat> in just five days, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be sworn in as president and vice president of the United States. Following the attack last week on the Capitol complex, there's been unprecedented mobilization of security in the Capitol. I want to express gratitude uh, to our Capitol Police, uh, to the National Guard who are present here uh, to protect our democracy. They have shown great courage. I'm very proud of them, and I was honored to be able to extend gratitude to them in person uh, on behalf of the Congress. We must subject this, this whole complex, though, to scrutiny in light of what happened and the fact that the inauguration is coming. To that end, I have asked retired Lieutenant General Russell Honore uh, to lead an immediate review of security infrastructure, interagency processes, and command and control. As a former vice director of for operations, J3, with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, his focus was military support to civilian authorities. Military support to civilian authorities. And he has experience with national, the national capital region's security. House leadership has worked with General Honore, seeing up close and personal his excellent leadership at the time of Katrina. Mr. Kyburn was the head of our Katrina Task Force. 
So he and I and others uh, know full well how fortunate we are that the general has accepted uh, is willing to do this. Members are moving forward with strong oversight from committees, of course, to have after action review. There is strong interest in the Congress in the 9-11 type commission and outside, outside commission to conduct that after action review. In the meantime, I'm very grateful for, to General Honoré for taking on this responsibility. I, uh, I find this to be a very emotional time. I said to the members, we're very passionate to our reaction to this assault on our democracy, on this temple to democracy. We're very passionate about our reaction, but we must be very dispassionate in how we make decisions to go forward for security, security, security. As I see many of the film and the incitement of it all by the President of the United States. But as you see the film, one figure, oh, there's so many disgusting images, but one figure of a man in a shirt with the Auschwitz on it. Auschwitz, working for freedom, Auschwitz. This is in this January, one year ago, I had the privilege of bringing a delegation in January to Yad Vashem, the Museum of the Holocaust in, in Israel, to join heads of state. I came as the head of this Congress to observe the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, Birkenau. On the way, to Israel, I brought the delegation to Auschwitz and Birkenau. Probably one of the most transformative national security visits that we have made. All of our travel outside the country is about our national security. And so was that. To see the dehumanizing of people that was perpetrated was so, so overwhelming. To see this shirt on and his anti-Semitism that he has bragged about, to be part of a white supremacist raid on this capital requires us to have an after action review. To assign responsibility to those who are part of organizing it and incentivizing it. In the meantime, we're grateful to General Honoré for making some recommendations to us and how we can keep our members safe, our staff safe, the people who make the building function, our custodians and the rest, who had to clean up after this insurrectionist mob. But security, we take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, our democracy, and that is what we will do. And we will protect all of those who are here to honor their first of all. Questions? Yes, ma'am? Who are here to honor their first of all. Questions? Yes, ma'am? Is there any um, update on when you might send the article of the to the Senate? And secondly, can you tell us how quickly the House might take up President Bullock's recovery package? Well, uh, let me start with uh, the, uh, we're very pleased with what the Vice President put forth last night. I'm eagerly awaiting some of the particulars of the uh, vaccine proposal that will come out this afternoon because this is a matter of complete urgency. As the Vice President said last night, this administration, the Trump administration, handled the distribution of the vaccine in a very disappointing way. He used stronger language. 
But now we have to move on and do it in the right way, and that will require resources, which will require legislation. How it will be done effectively, uh, we'll, we'll know more about. I have some idea about it because we've made suggestions in that regard. Uh, but I think that the message of last night and later today from the Vice President will be a message of hope to encourage people to, again, when they, can, when they are, it's appropriate for them to receive the vaccine to do so. But as was said, as, as will be said, it's not just about the vaccine. It's about testing and distancing and all the rest as we go forward so that we can crush the virus, which is what we must do. Crush the virus so we can open our schools and our businesses, uh, honor our heroes who are on the front line of this, our healthcare workers, our police and fire first responders, transportation, sanitation, food workers, our teachers, our teachers, our teachers and put money in the pockets of the American people so that the lives and the livelihood of the American people are addressed. So we're hoping that we can work in a bipartisan way uh, as we go forward. Uh, in terms of the uh, timing of what our, as I mentioned, our, our we, one week ago, on January 6th, there was an act of insurrection perpetrated on the capital of the United States, incentivized by the President of the United States. One week later, Wednesday to Wednesday, that President was impeached in a bipartisan way by the House of Representatives. So urgent was the matter. They're now working on the, taking this to trial, and when they, you'll be the first to know. Uh, here with each other, we must trust that people have respect for their oath of office, respect for this institution. We must trust each other, respecting the people who sent us here. We must also have the truth, and when, and that will be looked into. Uh, the, uh, if in fact it is found that members of Congress were accomplices to this insurrection, if they aided and abetted the crime, then there have to be actions taken beyond the Congress and, and uh, in terms of prosecution for that. Yes, sir. Uh, we all are seeing the extraordinary uh, security measures now yes. in place here on Capitol, and really throughout the country, I'm just wondering your level of comfort uh, about next week's inauguration. Let me just say, thank you for the question. As a member of the J6, the committee that uh, prepares the inauguration, for a long time now, weeks, it has been determined that we would have a very small inauguration because of COVID. That in order to have... That new way to buy a car. See, pass off for all... Self-ignites is it's the key to that. Hot of people, tiny percentage of the people participated before. Most disappointing because obviously we're excited about nominating a new president of the United States, but not at the risk of people's health and well-being and indeed their lives. So this is always going to be small. Now with the insurrection of last week, it is necessitated by security to have more security but it hasn't changed the nature of the swearing in. I think it's important for people to know that. This is not a concession uh, to the terrorists. It is a recognition of the danger of COVID. Uh, so uh, 
again, uh, I'm in close touch. With, I will be again for like the third time in two days with the Secretary of the Army. Spoke with the head of the Secret Service last night. We all want to be sure um, that the requests that are made by uh, the Capitol Police are being honored by those who are in a position uh, to meet the needs. Of, uh, they, again, it, it depends on the intelligence, and we have to have more and more security than the te intelligence might warrant. I think in this case, redundancy may be necessary. Not too much, but enough. The Republicans are saying that as far as the metal detectors are concerned, that the danger on January 6th came from the outside, not the inside. And secondly, as far as the speaker's lobby is concerned, a totally different issue. When can we expect that to be open for us? And uh, as, as, will it be when the pandemic ends? And when do you see that happening? As far as it, will only, it won't be one minute before it is safe to do so from a COVID and a security standpoint or one minute later than that. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? The ledge branch of the benefit of the, the leg, legislative branch of the appropriations committee, yes. At the very minimum, what would you like to see in reform to the U.S. Capitol Police, especially in light of allegations uh, from members of the caucus of institutional racism within the police force and also maybe even collusion in the insurrection? What reforms would you like to see? Well, I think the investigation is central. That has to come first. Uh, but uh, there will be, in addition to uh, represent uh, Mr. Chairman Ryan's uh, Ledge Branch Committee, we have Homeland Security Committee, we have uh, issues that relate to intelligence from Judiciary and Intelligence Committee, we have the Armed Services Committee. So there'll be a full, uh, the committees will be doing their oversight in many different ways. And of course, the Appropriations Committee and the Oversight Committee have overarching responsibility. But it, 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 again, the investigation uh, will tell us uh, uh, what we need to know to have truth, but we can trust the system that we have here. And uh, it is, uh, imagine like 10 days ago, as I said, we, we really lost our innocence in this because we always prepare to protect and defend from all enemies foreign. But the Constitution always also says, and domestic. And now we have to protect ourselves from enemies domestic. How close within? Nancy the Pelosi heading on a range of issues there at her weekly news conference on Capitol Hill, uh, talking about the uh, raid on the Capitol. Uh, will, will, let us, will let us know. I said, Are you going to hold the article indefinitely? Are you considering withholding the article indefinitely? Well, there you have it. Um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, this is her uh, weekly briefing, of course. Uh, also, the first time we've heard from her since Wednesday. Wednesday, of course, being the day uh, that the House voted to impeach President Trump for the second time. Garrett Hake uh, covers the Hill for us. Garrett is back with me. Uh, and Garrett, she, she only spoke for 20, 25 minutes, but we learned a lot from the House Speaker. Uh, there we learned that Lieutenant General Russell Honore is going to be leading the investigation into uh, Capitol Hill security. Uh, we also learned uh, a little bit more about perhaps when that article of impeachment might head to the upper chamber. It looks like she's going to hold off until uh, President-elect Biden takes office and they get a better sense of, of this stimulus package that he's proposed. Is that, is that what you heard? Yeah, and this is Pelosi holding her cards pretty close to the vest here. I mean, not willing to go so far as to put a specific date on when the article could be transmitted. Uh, not willing to really engage on questions of security around the Capitol beyond that these are things that need to get investigated. I mean, the sense I got from Pelosi here is she is trying to keep the, her caucus locked in, keep the focus on the work that needs to be done here, and keep the possibility of the transmittal of that article of impeachment on the table, uh, at least as long as Donald Trump is still the President of the United States.
All right, Garrett Hake will have to leave it there because it's the top of the hour. Thank you, Garrett. That's going to do it for me. Andrea Mitchell reports starts right now. Thank you, Frank. Good day. I'm Andrea Mitchell in Washington, where D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser will be speaking moments from now on the elaborate coordinated efforts by federal and local officials to keep the Capitol safe. Only hours after news that a Sunday rehearsal for next week's inaugural was postponed due to unspecified security concerns. The focus on security is immediately apparent throughout Washington, which is in a lockdown never seen before. A massive National Guard presence, including thousands of troops guarding closed off streets lined with barricades, and more reinforcements still to come. At the We are opposed to political violence. We hate mobs, no matter who they claim to represent, period. But that's not all we're against. You can judge for yourself what happened last Wednesday in Washington. You know what that was, and you also know what it wasn't. It was not an act of racism. It was not an insurrection. It wasn't an armed invasion by a brigade of dangerous white supremacists. It wasn't. Those are lies. They're using what happened last week to justify the most sweeping crackdown on civil liberties and free speech in the history of this country. Well, there you go. You are watching Outnumbered. I'm Kennedy. Welcome to it. And here today is Fox Business anchor Dagan McDowell, Town Hall editor and Fox News contributor Katie Pavlich, Fox Nation host Tommy Laren, and joining us today, Chief White House correspondent John Roberts. And starting Monday, John will co-anchor America Reports with Sandra Smith weekdays from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern. Congratulations, John. Very excited about the move. Thank you, and uh, well I'm not done. spending my last day in the tent here at the White House on the North Lawn. It's a, it's a little bittersweet. I've been here for four years, covering literally every move that the president has made with a front row seat to one of the most incredible and tumultuous times in American history. Uh, so I'll be a little sad to leave, but to, to be able to be just across the street looking down over the White House, uh, bringing you the news of the day and everything that our viewers want to hear about, between the hours of one and three is going to be uh, a, a, an honor for me. Really looking forward to it. Kim. It's an exciting chapter, and we're going to talk about that a little later in the show. But John, paint a picture for me. What is it like in D.C., and what's the difference between last Wednesday and today as we head into inauguration week next week? So well, let me frame this by saying that this will be the sixth inauguration that I have covered, and uh, you know this goes all the way back to 2000, the inauguration of George W. Bush. And they were all national security events, uh, but this, what we see now, is unlike anything that I have ever seen before. I had to come through two checkpoints to get to the White House, and this is still five days before the inauguration. There was a National Guard checkpoint that I had to go through at first, then a police checkpoint after that. Uh, everybody was courteous, everybody was very calm. Uh, you show your access badge, you know, we have White House passes. Uh, that uh, get us through the, the roadblocks. But I can sense that as we march toward the inauguration on Wednesday, this is going to get tighter and tighter and tighter. Uh, I've been to a number of other national security events as well, starting with the millennial event on the National Mall and how tight the security was back then. Thankfully, everything came off uh, without a hitch. This last caller that talked, oh, he's getting paid, he's getting paid. The guy's probably going to lose a billion dollars of his own money. He's one of the few people that's ever been in the White House. And by the way, I don't remember anybody breaking into the White House. Uh, he's one of the few people that's ever occupied the White House that will leave with less than he, than he came in with. And these, uh, these Democrats are just blind, blindly hateful about Donald Trump. Is he bombastic? Does he talk when he should? Uh, did he say a lot of things over the four years and even before that made me cringe? Yeah, he really did. But we're independent oil. We're not fighting any wars in the Mideast. He ended ISIS. He moved the capital or the embassy to, to Jerusalem. Uh, he he uh, at least started on some criminal justice reform, uh, things that he really didn't even have to do. And then these people call up and, oh, Trump lies, Trump lies. Well, you know, Trump never told anybody you could keep your position in your, in your health care program if, if you John, like. John, let me ask you, you, you started with the comparison to, to Ronald Reagan. Would you put Trump ahead of Reagan? Mm, that's a tough question. Uh, Reagan certainly was 
more personable and a lot easier to like than Trump was. Uh, Policy-wise, I think Trump probably did more. Uh, Make America Great has become a slogan that's even, you know, we can't say the election was stolen. Uh, and there was irregularities, as they want to call them, some pretty glaring ones. We're never going to know, you know, because it's not going to be investigated. We're never going to know about under his escapades because it's never going to be investigated. Uh, uh, Paul Ryan stabbed Trump right in the back. And this, and just one more comment, and I know I'm, I'm getting a little more time than I expected. Why is it that networks, including C-SPAN, can always find a rhino to attack Republicans? Do they realize what Ocasio-Cortez is trying to do with our free speech? Do they realize that what the big tech is trying to do? And these are, these are the same tactics that the Democrats, the liberals are doing today, are the same tactics that the, that the Nazis came to power in Germany in the 30s. You can read history. There All right, that's John in California. Anthony in West Palm Beach, Florida. Democrat, good morning. Where would you rank good Donald morning. Trump? Oh, I, I rank him, he has to be last. Um, even below um, President James Buchanan, even President Andrew Johnson, who's the president that uh, uh, replaced um, um, President Abraham Lincoln after his death and tried to uh, help the South to regain their the power after um, after the um, 1450th Amendment passed. Why do you think he's worse than that? Oh, worse than that because um, the president's main job is to protect our democracy. And this gentleman, you know, beyond this, the president did speech and told the crowd to go to Congress while Congress was doing their duty to, 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 to certify the election. And he, he said in the speech that, you know, I'm not proud of what I'm hearing this president um, Kent, I'm hearing some bad things. And after President Kent, Kent did his speech, and, 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 and said that he wasn't going to turn the election, then he got a for the Congress. The president's job is to protect, not to incite, protect our government. And, and, and when the um, Congress people, congressmen and women, were calling, asked for help, he, re he did not um, um, allow um, uh, the, uh, the um, protection to come in. Marine, the Marines are only on the, uh, in Washington, D.C. They're only five minutes away from Congress. Anthony, on the attack on the Capitol, some news this morning, uh, NBC4 reporter in Washington, Scott McFarland, uh, pointing this out on Twitter just now. The U.S. Justice Department has announced a press briefing for 1 p.m. Eastern today uh, on the insurrection cases at the Capitol. Uh, we'll keep track of uh, the latest for you, but we're setting aside this last half hour of the program today just to hear from you uh, about where you think Donald Trump ranks among U.S. The federal officials, city officials, as well as security officials have discussed the remarkable preparations now for the inauguration planning that takes on, of course, much higher significance because not only of last week's Capitol insurrection, but what federal officials say is continuing. They say off the charts chatter online by extremists threatening additional attacks here in Washington and on state capitals around the country. Our crime and justice correspondent, Paul Prokopet. Uh, joins me now with more on that. Uh, Shimon, right behind you, I see some of the fencing uh, put in the Capitol Dome behind you, and fencing that just signifies that Joe Biden won't be inaugurated president in Fortress Washington. Fortress Washington, military, uh, I guess, uh, there are military, the military is all over uh, this area here, and all over Washington, you can see. I want to just show you behind me here, you can see some of the military vehicles, and all of the National Guard troops just lining all across uh, the road here. And this is all up and down the Capitol. And really, the threat is real, John, right? We, we keep talking about this threat and whether or not some people feel, well, maybe this isn't that real, or maybe this is just out of an abundance uh, of caution. It's not. Uh, and as you said, the chatter remains off the charts. The FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, military, all very concerned about what they're seeing and hearing uh, coming uh, from the various groups of people who are threatening uh, 
our country and it's people who live in this country. And all of this is all about securing the transfer of power. Normally here, we're on a constitution, uh, and so normally down here is where the parade would be. You'd have people lining up for the inauguration uh, and, and getting ready for the defense. You'd see jumbotrons, you'd see other things out here. There is none of that here, John. All you're seeing is fencing and security and more fencing. You can see uh, this truck here, more fencing coming in. Uh, I, I just didn't even know that this much fencing existed in this country, but it does. And they just keep having more and more just keeps arriving. Uh, you know, we're going to be hearing from security officials here in well, Washington and, 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 and the mayor the from Columbia. Muriel Bowser beginning okay. this very important security briefing here. My apologies, Mr. Mel Prober, but let's get straight to the news conference. I'm here to provide an update on preparations for the 59th presidential inauguration. With Metro Transit Police. Uh, also, Chief Conti of the Metropolitan uh, Police Department or DC Police, Kevin Donahue, uh, who is the City Administrator for the District of Columbia, uh, as well as Chief Donnelly, who is the Chief of the DC Fire and Emergency uh, in the Emergency Medical Service. Uh, we may uh, be also joined uh, by representatives of the DC National Guard. Uh, who uh, we have invited uh, to join us as well. Uh, let me start with a brief situational update and uh, we will then hear uh, from our guests. We, uh, I want to reiterate my request to, to Americans uh, to enjoy this 59th inauguration of the President of the United States and the Vice President of the United States uh, from home. Enjoy it virtually on January 20th. Our tradition, uh, in fact, our constitutional mandate uh, that the transition of power occurs by noon on January the 20th uh, will happen right here in the District of Columbia. Uh, and we want everybody to enjoy it uh, and enjoy it uh, right in their own states, in their own living rooms, and with their own families. We know that this is the right request for our public safety uh, and our public health. The National Park Service uh, is, of course, uh, the steward of our nation's parks, including uh, parks right here in Washington, D.C. And while the situation continues to change uh, each day, we do know that as of this morning, various road closures are in effect and garages in the district uh, uh, have been restricted as well. If you have tried to drive around the city, you already know this. There is a recent posting of streets that have been impacted by these closures. Uh, and here is the most recent list of road closures re released this morning by the National Park Service and in cooperation with the United States Secret Service. We continue to ask anyone who doesn't absolutely need to, to be out and about or in those restricted areas to avoid them. Earlier this week, Metro announced service adjustments that went into effect today and will be in place through Thursday, January 21st. And that includes 13 Metro stations and detouring 26 metro bus routes. You can learn more about those adjustments at WMATA, WMATA.com. Additionally, streetcar service in the district uh, is suspended, uh, and you can continue to find updates on that at inauguration.dc.gov. We also know that residents are eager to do what they can do to keep our city safe. Uh, and NHL center right. Spectacular. Are you kidding me? Round yourselves when you're out and about. Uh, and if you see something, absolutely say something. Uh, and you may report anything that you think is out of the norm by calling 911. Uh, you may su report suspicious activity at 727 9099. You can go to MPD's iWatchDC.org website or text TIPS to 50411. 
We are also recommending. We're trying to do our best and as fast as we can so you guys can make it work. Let anyone know that firearms are not welcome on the premises. We want businesses who encounter anyone with a weapon to call 911 and try not to confront uh, that person or persons themselves. These signs can be downloaded at inauguration.dc.gov. Later today, uh, HCMA, that's DC's Homeland Security Agency and MPD, will host a community call to discuss the district's planning. Going to be in this dump, if you will. Well, first of all, uh, I was expecting them taken by now. It looks like they're a little late in, in coming out. But what we're expecting is uh, deposition, train. Broadcast live on Channel 16, as well as all D.C. government platforms. If you haven't already done so, sign up to receive specific alerts by registering. Uh, you can register and text INOV. 2021 to 888-777. And finally, all of this information can be located in one place at inauguration.dc.gov. Once again, uh, I, we will hear from our partners who have been engaged in this planning and are responsible for various aspects of execution. Life to what we know about the origins of the Russia investigation, why Carter Page and George Papadopoulos were suspected, uh, why a Halper decided to bring that information to the FBI. Was the dossier part of a disinformation campaign designed to obscure an investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails by turning the spotlight on to President Trump and the Trump campaign? Now, the President Trump has long insisted that he was spied on uh, other officials have a different opinion of that, saying that this nation's 59th presidential inauguration, designated as a national special security event, or NSSE, the Secret Service is again serving as the lead agency with respect to operational planning and security for the event. As most of you are aware, the Department of Homeland Security recently extended the NSSE designation dates for the period <coughs> covering January 13th to January 21st, in response to the events of January 6th, when an election protest turned into a violent, deadly, and unlawful assault on the United States Capitol. For well over a year, we have been working with our federal, state, and municipal partners to develop and implement a comprehensive operational security plan to ensure the safety of everyone participating in the event as well as those who may try to come to D.C. to watch the inauguration or spend time in the nation's capital. Anyone who's seen any of the mayor's recent press conferences or listened to her earlier statements will realize we are discouraging this in lieu of virtual participation, but we are prepared. We cannot allow a recurrence of the chaos and illegal activity that the United States and the world witnessed last week. Our democracy is built on the rule of law and the Secret Service workforce is dedicated and committed to uphold its oath to the Constitution and assure that its vital, no-fail mission regarding the security of the presidential inauguration and the peaceful transfer of power is carried out. To harbor that investigation by releasing too much information too early. However, the bottom line is that the Trump administration is coming to an end. The Biden administration has no intention of releasing any of this information, especially given that Joe Biden was in on that January 5th Oval Office meeting with President Obama when he asked about uh, going after Michael Flynn uh, with the Logan Act. Uh, there are lots of questions about what the Obama administration was doing in terms of hindering the incoming Trump administration. During the inauguration include, among many, many others, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which is responsible for incident response and recovery, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, which is responsible for intelligence and incident investigation, and of course, the men and women of the Metropolitan Police Department. As for any NSSE, the Secret Service's core strategy is to leverage our existing outstanding partnerships with our local law enforcement, public safety, and military colleagues here in the National Capital Region. 
as well as those who are directly here in support of the week's events and to collaboratively develop a comprehensive security plan for the inauguration. As you would expect, there are many partners involved in this planning, a number of whom are here behind me. The Secret Service employs a unified command model. We establish an executive steering committee, which is staffed with senior representatives from these agencies and others, who have primary jurisdiction over various aspects of the inauguration, and then create subcommittees, in this particular instance, 28, dedicated to everything from crowd management, credentialing, maritime security, access control, medical care, just to name a few. Yeah. There are many that feel like this president has been attacked from before day one, before he stepped into office, with witch hunt after witch hunt, and we deserve some answers, and so does our president. It is to ensure we have an immediate, well-coordinated, and effective response to any of the challenges we might face during this inauguration. Using this process, We've developed a comprehensive, integrated, and while it may not look like it from the outside, nimble security plan to ensure a safe environment for our protectees, the event, and the general public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Uh, I am Mary Tierney. I am the Regional Administrator for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. While FEMA is not a law enforcement agency, public safety is our number one priority for the inauguration. FEMA has taken several actions to promote good public safety during this event. Uh, the president has declared an emergency that has enabled FEMA to do several things. Uh, the first thing is we have deployed a national incident management team to the DC Emergency Operations Center to work in support of our district partners. We have also deployed regional incident management assistance teams to both Maryland and Virginia to support their planning and actions. Uh, we have been working with the district to identify resource requirements. For example, we are currently working in mission to pre-stage ambulance resources, and also we have moved commodities such as food, water, and shelter supplies closer in to support the district should that be needed. We continue to support the Secret Service in their efforts to plan for this event. FEMA has also conducted several exercises in response to requests from the Secret Service as well as other agencies to help prepare since January 6th. Um, that is all I have pending any questions. Six. Um, that is all I have pending any questions. Let me now uh, introduce uh, Jeff Rein uh, Reinbold, who is the su superintendent for the National Mall Memorial Parks uh, uh, from the National Park Service. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Good afternoon. Um, inaugurations are special times, right, for our nation, for our city, and especially for those of us at the National Mall who host a lot of the events around an inauguration. Uh, this one is no doubt very challenging. And we've had a chance to work with the Presidential Inaugural Committee since November uh, and uh, to come up with a, a reimagined uh, inauguration. We did receive a letter from the U.S. Secret Service yesterday uh, asking us to consider closing several areas within the National Mall. This is essentially the monumental core, the area around the White House um, and sections of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, I do want to thank the Secret Service, the U.S. Park Police, for working with us to understand what their concerns are, how we could help address this national security issue, uh, to make sure that the icons that we administer are protected, um, and also to make sure that, um, if possible, we could allow First Amendment activities in the park. Uh, we are the premier First Amendment area in the country, uh, in the world probably, and we wanted to see if it was possible to do that and also meet their security needs. So as of this morning, uh, the Secretary of the Interior has officially closed the areas in the National Mall. Um, that includes, again, the core area and the, the, the uh, locations that the mayor mentioned before um, in support of the, the request from the Secret Service and the U.S. Park Police. I do want to talk for just a second about the First Amendment areas. Um, we were able to identify two locations. We had two groups that, or several groups that had submitted First Amendment uh, applications, and we were able to identify 
two locations on Pennsylvania Avenue where uh, up to 100 people will be able to gather. Uh, they will be met by U.S. Park Police, escorted through magnetometers, and then um, taken to these areas so that they can uh, exercise their First Amendment rights. The Park Police and the Secret Service uh, were trying to find a way that we could accommodate that to recognize that this, these are different times and require different measures. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Mayor Bowser for working with the Secretary of the Interior to address some of the concerns uh, of, uh, uh, that she has for the city. Stephen Booker, the Acting Assistant Chief for the United States Park Police. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. On behalf of Acting Chief, Chief uh, Monaghan and the United States Park Police, the men and women, uh, as uh, Agent Matt Miller said, this is unprecedented. Uh, this inauguration is something filled with excitement, hope, and hopefully a new path forward. Uh, the United States Park Police, as stewards of democracy, um, are to ensure that First Amendment rights are allowed to occur on federal park lands, and our officers do it with emotional and uh, personal fortitude to make sure that the mission of the National Park Service and the Department of Interior is intact. Um, our roles are not only the law enforcement arm the National Park Service within in Washington, D.C., but also San Francisco and in, in New York as well. We, hear, we are here to stand by the, the NSSE and all of our D.C. officials, our public safety administrators, our local law enforcement to ensure a safe and secure event next week. We work collaboratively and we have been doing so for months now in our incident management team with many men and women engulfed long hours into this planning. I, I congratulate them, a few more days left, ensure we have a safe event for next week. I'm here afterwards for any additional questions that you may have. Thank you. Paul Wiedefeld, General Manager for Metro Walmart. Thank you, Mayor Bowser, for your leadership uh, during this inaugural, but more importantly, for your leadership that is this tournament here and your support for Metro. Thank you so much. Uh, I also want to give a special thanks to our frontline employees. These are the bus operators, the train operators, the station managers, and our police who have once again shown their commitment to this region during this difficult time and this difficult year. <clears throat> Working with Chief Conte and the U.S. Uh, Secret Service, we, we basically have to ensure that we have safety for our employees and for our customers but at the same time providing service for those that still need it outside of the, of the security area. What the customers will see is a stepped up uh, transit police presence. We also have reached out to our, our brethren basically at other transit agencies and you will see police officers from Baltimore, New York, New Jersey, Chicago, New Orleans, Houston, Denver, and San Francisco also in our system throughout this week. As the mayor mentioned, there will be 11, there are 11 rail stations already closed today and two more tomorrow, and 26 bus lines will be impacted. Again, the best information for that is on our website, wilmata.com. These, uh, these, these uh, closures and diversions will stay in effect until through Thursday the 21st. <coughs> in closing, I know this is inconvenient for our customers and for a lot of businesses in the region, but it's necessary for their safety as well. So thank you again, Mayor, for your leadership on this. Uh, and I want to introduce now uh, the Legal Law Enforcement Agency for the District, of course, uh, and, and Chief Robert Conti uh, to speak for MPD. And we will uh, be available for questions, members of my entire team who are standing uh, to my left, Chief Conti.
Every four years, our nation celebrates and honors the continuation and peaceful transition of presidential executive powers. Never want to regulate their allies. It's funny how that works. But the Democrats have been telling us over and over again that they want to unify, that they want to have a President Biden and a Vice President Harris that are for all Americans. And they insist that they are not left-wing radicals. They insist that they are moderates. Well, how come then have we not heard any prominent Democrats coming out talking about censorship, talking about the big tech monopoly? If they are so moderate and they want to be the representation of all Americans, what about the 50% of us who are deplatformed, who are censored, who are silenced, who are shadow banned? Where are those moderate and unifying Democrats that are going to come and talk about an issue that's very real for most Americans? They're just These members of the outside law enforcement agencies from across the nation have provided vital support to MPD in the inaugural proceedings and will do so again this year. While things are different this year due to the ongoing public health emergency and the insurrection that took place at the Capitol last week, it rests upon the dedicated law enforcement officers to provide the utmost in safety, security, and professional police service to all those who come to take part in this momentous occasion. The expertise of each participating law enforcement, public safety, and military agency is critical to, to the success of a coordinated and executed security plan. The Metropolitan Police Department has carefully planned for resources and personnel for this event, and the additional resources will enable MPD to provide the same great level of quality and professional police service to our communities. All of our officers will be on hand to participate in ensuring a peaceful day, both for inaugural events and throughout our great city. MPD continually collaborates with our federal partners and monitors various intelligence sources for information regarding possible threats to D.C. At this time, I really would just like to echo the comments of our mayor for people to really enjoy this as a virtual event. Uh, we are working hard not only to secure the event itself, but also working very hard to reassure the communities of the District of Columbia that we are prepared for this event. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, we'll take some questions, and I think Susanna is going to uh, help us get people acknowledged, and if you could just state your name in your um, organization. Sure, yes, this is Michael Bryce Taylor with the Washington Post. My first question is, for the people who live and work downtown in the district, what's the protocol for them if they need to access areas that are currently fenced off? Okay, thanks for that question. Uh, Michael's asking, how does a, a resident access the se secured areas? And um, I'm going to ask the, the Secret Service to address that question. And returning to Jim Comey, the author of Saving Justice, uh, his new book, uh, Mr. Comey, let's pick up where I just left off, where the Vice President was in his pre- There isn't a man or woman in Secret Service who is not keenly aware of just how much of an impact our security measures have. And please believe me when I say we do everything we can to mitigate and lessen the necessary security measures to safeguard an event like this. For everyone inside what we call the green line or the red line, the outer secure perimeter. We have divided that up into 12 zones. We have an agent who over the last seven months has been reaching out to all the property managers, all the businesses, and all the federal buildings, office buildings, etc., to coordinate what people will need to get in and out on foot or when parking garages will be closed down and when they'll need to walk out in order to get transportation from there. My first recommendation, if there is any confusion, would be to talk to the property manager, um, the front office staff, to find out what they were told. And if there is still further confusion, to make sure they find who that Secret Service agent is. And again, the building, the security, the management will know who that individual is to find out, and if there are special accommodations which need to be made, we also have the ability to do that. We work very closely with the U.S. Attorney's offices, the courts, law enforcement who are working these criminal investigations pursuant to last week to make sure they can go on without interruption. We've had to do that with other businesses as well. But we have been engaging in outreach 
with all of our partners, both residential, commercial, and government, to make sure that they can access their residences, their businesses, or their um, places of work. To that, what, I'm oh, sorry, a quick follow-up to that, where will media be permitted on the day of the inauguration? Um, that will have to defer to the communications subcommittee. They've been coordinating with all the various media partner, partners and outlets to make sure that they are credentialed and that they have, I don't know specifically right now, but we can get that answer back to you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, Jane Becker, Washingtonian. Um, last time we saw some trouble with hotels where they were overrun by people on masks who were potentially violent. Handle it. Um, I know that Airbnb has promised that it's not going to uh, be renting out properties during the coming. What guidance have you given to hotels? Are hotels uh, going to be shutting down? And if not, what kind of support are you going to be offering them to help them manage what might be coming in? So um, I think we, we addressed this question uh, earlier in the week, uh, and I think it should be pretty clear that we have housing needs uh, still in the city. So we have not uh, we have not ordered hotels to shut down in the central business district or in the district. However, uh, we do know that they know their business operations the best, uh, and they may make a decision um, not to offer services for public safety reasons or other reasons. Uh, during this period of time. We have been in close contact with um, the hotel associations and various property managers. We will continue to do that uh, and they can continue to call on MPD for other help. Uh, and the next question is with so much being blocked off downtown, uh, so much enforcement there, I think people are thinking, okay, if these people can't get downtown, where do they go next? What is the threat level? How concerned should people be who live in neighborhoods near, near the downtown area or live in historically black neighborhoods across the city? Uh, let me first uh, ask the United States Secret Service to talk uh, in general about how they're preparing for security and uh, MPD and HCMA do to add to that. Hey, Mayor. Um, as far as the current threat situation, I don't think anybody is unaware of Director Ray's testimony or the FBI's releases on um, the proliferation of, for lack of a better term, chatter around the country. All 50 state FBI JTTFs in the four territories are working 24 hours a day to pursue every lead, every credible threat, and run that to ground. It is truly a whole of government approach. As far as specifics, for security for this inauguration, we do recognize because we have such a robust and hardened perimeter, we have so many assets inside the Penn Quarter Capital area that there is the potential for people to go elsewhere, whether it's back to their state capitals or to other parts of the city. MPD serves this city exceptionally well. We have had very candid conversations about we can't create a fortress and allow the rest of the city to suffer services, whether it's fire EMS or public safety. There is a very, very good plan led by Chikanti, Assistant Chief Carroll, Commander Glover. The city should not be concerned that they will, not, that they will be let down by MPDC. There's also a plan with the Bureau, the National Guard Bureau, and with all the representatives here in the city, should there be intelligence directing threats to other state capitals, they can respond in a timely and appropriate fashion. Does that answer your question? Uh, I believe so. Thank you. I'm Sam Gore with Channel 7. Um, I had a question for uh, the director, uh, Reinbold, talking about the protests that will be allowed. Uh, I'd like just to know more about this uh, in this case. Um, you said there were two protests or two locations? I'm, I'm not quite clear on that, and, and people will be checked to go. Could you tell us a little more about that? Sure, we had uh, t we had two requests for First Amendment activities, and so uh, we had numerous requests, including from the city, to cancel uh, all permitted activities within the park. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say that most of the people that had special events, whether they be weddings or celebrations uh, on MLK Day, work with us in different locations, different places. Uh, the, the two First Amendment um, permits that we received, the requests, uh, we were able to work with them, identify a size of the group that uh, the, 
at least were able to look at specific locations and figure out how many they thought could fit in those areas and meet COVID requirements and still safety requirements. Um, we've done this in the past before. We'll have escorted folks in often at inaugurations. And so this would be an opportunity where those groups can come, those folks can come, um, they'll be screened through magnetometers, they'll be with, um, with U.S. Uh, Park Police uh, the entire time to their location and they'll have the ability to express their First Amendment, um, their First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. What are the... We need to take a harsher stance against China, including investigating what went on with Eric Swell. And two, I do think on a more personal level, Nancy Pelosi just doesn't like to admit that she screwed up and was wrong. So she keeps betting on this himbo has been. We live in a country with more guns than people, where we have many, many people who have been radicalized by constant lies about everything, the virus and our institutions, but especially about the lies about the election. And they're uh, among that group of people who have been deluded are people who've been moved to violence. Almost the way that an Al-Qaeda motivates its foot soldiers with a constant stream of lies telling them you're on the Lord's side. Well, there's people who think they're on the right side of history because they've been lied to by the president, his neighbors in and outside of government. And that's a dangerous situation because they're all over the country and they're not Islamists trying to sneak into our country. They're here, they live all over the country and they're armed. Customizes your home insurance. Here's my title really taking. Uh, have have been made. As it relates to a curfew, we will continue as we do with uh, every event to evaluate the use of a curfew uh, as, as a tool. Possibility of people's cars being searched when they either come into Washington, D.C. or come into any of the areas near the perimeter. Let me ask um, Secret Service um, Agent, Agent Miller and Chief Conti. Thank you, Mayor. Um, to amplify the mayor's uh, response on the closures. Uh, as you saw on the graph there, there are written street closures published across all of the various law enforcement and public safety partners. So whether it's the Secret Services, social media sites, the District of Columbia, the Metropolitan Police Department. We are working on publishing as we typically do. I would just caution everyone, we are currently making version 11, given all the changes dictated by the events of the six. And there are still negotiations, as the mayor indicated, with Richmond to when the bridges across the river will be closed, when they will be reopened, which specific bridges those will be. Um, as far as your question about cars and other traffic, so trucks making deliveries to hotels or businesses, any vehicle with a secure perimeter is in place that enters one of the designated checkpoints will be searched for explosives, weapons, and other prohibited items. So there will be a white team from the Metropolitan Police Department, the Secret Services Technical Security Division, and depending on uh, resource constraints, uh, Department of International Guard, explosive ordnance specialists. We are looking for weapons, threats, or explosives. Outside that, the vehicle is safe to enter once it's been cleared and set as a legitimate purpose inside the zone. But outside the zone, can people expect those type of searches outside just during the city? And then can I also ask you about use of force? I know the National Guard is not here, but can you tell us when use of force would be acceptable by any of these National Guard groups who we see who are armed? Okay, that's a two-part question. So, Thank part you. one, outside of the secure vehicles, residents, guests will be able to enter and uh, transit the district as normal. But only when you are going to enter what we call the green line or the red line. The green line is essentially the soft perimeter leading up to the red line where there are absolute purpose coming in. So outside of that, vehicles and uh, deliveries will continue as normal. Your second question as far as rules of engagement. The National Guard Bureau was publishing rules of engagement and printing rules of engagement cards for each of its soldiers deployed on this exercise. My understanding is that those rules of engagement or the use of force policy will comply with the agency to which they were assigned. So I know, for instance, that there's detail of National Guard Bureau personnel up at the United States Capitol. They are complying with and will comport with the United States Capitol Police's use of force model. Most of the use of force models, the residential and local uh, law enforcement community, are very, very similar. There's not much daylight between them. There are some specific exceptions, but 
You can probably find it through the U.S. Capitol Police or the National Guard Bureau, unless Chief Conti, do you know the specifics for your for, for no. Yeah, <clears throat> Mark. Uh, with respect to the uh, U.S. With respect to National Guard uh, specifically, as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, those policies are pretty much follow the same framework as the, as the host agency. You know, obviously in defense of, of one's life or, or another. Um, I think with the, specifically with the D.C. National Guard for MPDs, uh, trackers, those persons that are deployed, their primary mission is to focus on traffic, traffic management. And that's a different mission from what uh, what's going on at the U.S. Uh, Capitol Police. So I think that's a distinction to make there. Uh, the other thing, too, with respect to your question about the uh, vehicles being being searched outside of the uh, if we have information, and as you know from the previous um, demonstrations that we've had here in our city, we've had armed individuals to come to our city, and there were firearms uh, recovered in some instances. There were uh, explosives recovered in, in another instance, all top cockpits on a vehicle. So it doesn't need, obviously, within the framework of the Constitution, a vehicle uh, for some type of check for weapons or something like that. We certainly, uh, we'll be uh, deploying that um, that measure as well. Good afternoon. I'm James Wright with the Washington Informer newspaper. I have a question for Acting Chief Cutty and Mr. Wiedefell. Yes, Chief. Go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Chief Conte, we want to make sure that we have this right. MPD, uh, for lack of a better term, all hands on deck. Uh, MPD will be all hands on deck for the inauguration zone. But what about the rest of the city? Will the rest of the city be covered and will they be covered competently, even though you have many off? Um, Thank you for the question. It's a, it's a great question, and I'll, I'll answer that specifically. Uh, it's not just all hands on deck for the zone. Uh, it's all hands on deck for our entire agency, uh, because our entire agency has responsibility for the entire city. Uh, with that being said, the influx of federal resources that you see uh, in the city certainly allows for MPD to be agile, to be very nimble in terms of our uh, response to any threats that could may occur in any of our uh, communities. Uh, we will have assets uh, pre-stationed throughout different communities, uh, ready to respond, and a contingency of uh, federal support if need be to respond to any threats that, that may present themselves. We actually have the... Just a second. Where, when it comes to fewer police and their ability to fight back against violent agitators that were on the streets of America and cities across the country, for nine months. And so this will just have long-term consequences on the safety of those places that want police in their communities. People travel through that area to get to their jobs and obligations. And many of those people are low-income and working-class people, and they can go to telework in terms of getting to their jobs. When this plan came through, did that come to you as consideration? Of course, of course it did. Um, that was one of our largest concerns. We continue to serve the our customer base. Uh, we argue for an effect to be able to put trains through the zone so that people get to the other side without having to uh, get off train and get, uh, to get there. So that was a huge concern of ours. But as I said earlier, it, it is something that we don't uh, welcome, but is something that we all need to do to keep everyone safe. Hi, thank you. I'm CPS Sierra. Um, I News. Um, my first question is, is there any indication that extremist groups like the Proud Boys or the Boogaloos are planning on being the inaugural next week or showing up? Special um, agent. I would defer a specific answer to the FBI. I know that they are actively investigating and talking with a number of extremist groups, searching the internet, social media for any indication they can get. And they are very, very careful to delegate between credible, specific, direct intelligence and information. So I'm not entirely certain and I'm not entirely competent to answer the question. It is better addressed to the FBI, but as Director Ray has mentioned, there's a great deal of very concerning chatter, and it's what you don't know that we're preparing for. So I don't know if anyone raised their hand to say, we are coming, we will be there, but we are preparing as if they are. Let me just add that um, our team, uh, led by Director Rodriguez and MPD, are having a daily uh, download with the FBI to follow up on special special agents comment. Thank you. Um, just my second question. People say the city kind of looks like a military takeover. 
Um, there's armed troops, roadblocks, even just around the corner from where we are right now. Um, what message, Mayor, are you sending? Uh, I want to be very clear about this. Uh, as a person yeah. raised in this city, I have spent uh, many days, I have spent a lot of time in and around our national monumental core uh, at these iconic structures uh, at the Capitol building uh, where there was attempted coup. All of these things uh, are so important, not just to America, uh, but to the 712,000 people who call DC home. Uh, we traverse uh, these roads and parks uh, each and every day. Uh, the National Park is a park, uh, and it is used not as a First Amendment demonstration, uh, but for people to, to walk around the park to get exercise, play games, you name it. Uh, so we are, we don't take any of the measures that we have taken uh, lightly. Let me say something about your comment about a takeover. I have to remind DC residents uh, that I asked the federal government uh, to devise a deployment plan that would protect federal assets in the District of Columbia. Uh, and that has, is what has been done under the leadership of the United States Secret Service and the various agencies that have been mentioned. That is important, as you heard Giconti say, uh, because uh, our officers can also focus on uh, keeping DC safe. Uh, from any, any aspects of crime, including uh, from these extremist groups that have attacked our capital. Hi, Mayor, uh, everyone up here. Um, question for you is specifically due to the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, is, they, is there any more information regarding what is expected? Uh, and when it comes to the permitted event, what happens if more than 100 people show? And what happens if people start to gather in places that are outside the center that has been established? Okay, let me first thank you for asking that uh, question, Stephanie, um, because part of uh, my reasoning and requesting that this NSFE, this National Special Security uh, event, be advanced, the timeline for the advance, is because the inauguration is not the only target or, or activity that's out there being discussed. Um, there are other events that lead up to that, uh, and we thought it was very important that the um, the proven and effective framework that the U.S. Secret Service sets up for the national security events uh, would also be helpful in the lead up to the inauguration. I'm going to ask Chief Conti uh, to talk about uh, those uh, threats and perhaps um, Park Service or Park Police talk about the First Amendment events. Use of grass to become Trump aides and supporters, including White House Press Secretary McEnany, Senator Ted Cruz, and Congressman Dan Crenshaw. In a petition obtained by this, the students called the three, quote, Mike. He's the mayor, uh, Dale, just on the information uh, that's out there. And, uh, and I can assure the residents of the District of Columbia that the Metropolitan Police Department and our federal partners are in a posture to respond to the, to the mission that's out there thus far that we've heard. And I think that's been, you know, it's, it's been on all the news channels. Uh, we're hearing it, so we, we're certainly in a posture to respond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in terms of this weekend, you will start to see now the fencing has gone up. Uh, as the Secret Service starts to activate some of those perimeters, uh, we will fully support that. Access will become uh, more and more restricted within the National Mall and with the areas that we have uh, inside those boundaries. But we have worked with everyone, all of the permittees that had requested either special events or demonstrations, but from now through the inauguration to find another time, find another location for their activity. Uh, for those two events that we have, um, they are groups that uh, are very, my understanding is that groups that um, uh, are, are in D.C. Uh, have... Uh, express First Amendment activities quite frequently throughout the district, um, and we've had a chance to talk to them and be able to um, make sure that they're able to, to scale their um, their uh, First Amendment demonstrations to the size that we have available. So we also thank them for working with us on this. Yeah, do you anticipate the area to go back to normal immediately after the SSE period is, has ended or is expected to end? I think that we're going to go back to a new normal, Stephanie, um, and I think that our entire country has to deal with how our intelligence apparatus, security apparatus, at every level, uh, deal with a very real and present threat uh, to our nation. Uh, we saw white extremists start a Capitol building uh, who were trained and organized and seemingly with the intent uh, to capture the Vice President of the United States and perhaps uh, harm other lawmakers. Uh, so we all have to think about a new posture. We certainly have to think about a new uh, posture in the city. So while we focused on January the 20th, we're also focused on January the 21st and every day thereafter uh, in the nation's capital. 
Mayor. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you, and everyone on the stage as well. Kevin Moten with ABC News. Just to follow up on that last question, I wanted to go down that. Is that do you expect many of the security measures we see now to last well after an elect take office to continue providing that protection and helping the Secret Service provide that protection to President Biden, to Vice President Harris? Uh, we, we do not expect uh, to have any National Guard uh, throughout the city um, for weeks uh, to come. No, we, we don't expect that. But I do think that we have to replace that sense of security uh, in, in other ways. Um, so we certainly, from the district's perspective, will be thinking about that. We're actually also thinking about how our, our partnership with the federal government has changed so that we can have that increased sense of security. I won't bore you with the kind of the details of how we're budgeted to support um, our, our security because we're the nation's capital, but those issues have to be dealt with. We also have to deal with uh, the, the complicating factor of not being a state uh, in that uh, the mayor of the District of Columbia does not com command the DC National Guard. Or it's live from one to three. And then story with Martha McCallum will then air at ready time, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon in the West. You're going to love it. Fox News on time kicks off at 7 p.m. All times are Eastern. And we'll see you right there. All right, thanks everyone for uh, another basic day. So much more to. Let me see. Chris, uh, look more like military base. You touched on it there, but I have to ask you what goes through you when you see your city? the way it does now. Is there a disappointment? Is there a, a realization that this is the reality that we're in? I'm sad about it. I have to tell you that it, that it looks that way. Uh, I'm committed uh, to making sure that we get our city back. Our visitors, our residents, our workers uh, will be able to get through uh, the city with ease. But I also know that we have a special responsibility. There's a peaceful transition of power in our country. We're proud of Washington to host the federal government. Uh, we want to make sure um, that event is peaceful. Hi, Amanda with the Washington City Paper. A follow on that. Um, Mayor, do you think a fence around the Capitol should stay, or do you think that should be the first after all of this? I mean, I generally don't like fences, as you know, uh, but I, I also see why it's important, especially now. Uh, it's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, those fences allow uh, these police professionals to be able to deploy the, the human resource that they have, the officers, in a more efficient way. Uh, in, in other times, we were more concerned about interactions between police and people, and that fence is an additional barrier to reduce uh, some of those interactions. So I think we, we are concerned about any fencing that's up in the District of Columbia uh, we move, uh, it's a temporary fence, it's not a permanent fence. See how quickly can, if it goes up, it can just as quickly come down. Uh, but we want to make sure that there's not only a real replacement for what it provides, uh, but the sense of safety that everybody in and around those facilities has is important. So we, we haven't fully recommendation to our federal partners about when it happens. And the last question is, what are the estimated costs for all of this, given the height of security? I mean, I know last I heard the district requested, was it $45 million to Congress? Do you have any? For the inauguration? Okay, I'm going to ask um, Chris Rodriguez to come up, who's the director of the district's uh, Homeland Security Agency. He's also going to talk to you about a very specific process that we put in place to protect the district and ensure that we had a seamless process for federal assistance. Uh, director Rodriguez? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you uh, for the question, man. We start seeing those things there's snow, also into Marshall, Minnesota, looking at the snow showers continuing. Also, uh, Yankton, the area, looking at the snow. To take a trip to the northeast, a lot of this is... Take a seat. At least 11.3 million doses given, that's administered in people's arms. The officials are giving an update on the security preparations being taken for an operation day. Let's go to Fox News National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin, live in Washington. Before. Jennifer? Hi, Dagan. Well, we just heard the police in Washington, D.C. say that all 3,800 uh, D.C. police will be on duty uh, through the inauguration, during the inauguration. And we also have learned from the Secret Service that they will have explosive teams checking each vehicle in the city, EOD teams that will be checking for uh, car bombs or truck bombs in the days and coming days ahead. The FBI says there are, they're making dozens of arrests in connection with the killing of the Capitol Hill police uh, policemen on, uh, during the mob scene at the Capitol on January 6th. Dozens have been arrested. Federal prosecutors have charged Robert Keith Packer for violent injury or disorderly conduct on Capitol grounds, among other charges. Prosecutors say he was inside and out of the Capitol building wearing a Kemp Auschwitz sweatshirt. Eric Munchel, author, authorities say he brought zip ties, which can be used as hand restraints into the Capitol building. I suspect what other level of distrust.
how you deal with that security issue if members of Congress do not feel secure from other members of Congress. It's pretty incredible, Chuck, that the Democrats don't trust some members of the Republican Party who actually there have been a, a request for an investigation into some of these members, particularly three or four of them, that they played a role perhaps in what happened on January 6th. Speaker Pelosi said at her news conference just about an hour ago, that should this investigation find that uh, they did have a role, that perhaps, perhaps it's something more than Congress can deal with, that it's something that law enforcement and the legal system needs to address. Right. But there's all sorts of signs. Lots of hang over the office firefighters battled the fire. ...detectors to get out into the House floor that members of Congress have to walk to. Walk through us. Uh, the first days that they were there, members were walking around them. Some Republicans were refusing to walk through. So what Speaker Pussy did is she instituted a $5,000 fine for the first offense and 10000 for the second right. offense. But this level, you know, I've never seen anything like it. That people don't even want to be in the same room. And there's another level of distrust as well, not just on the security regarding weapons and insurgency, but also COVID right. as well, because some of these members are refusing to wear masks. Chuck. Yeah, I'm curious, was the House Republican leadership? military presence than in Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq combined. The final days of Trump's presidency have turned downtown Washington really into something out of war zone, and it has robbed the country of one of its most important rituals, the peaceful and dignified transfer of power with one president handing off to the next. I will start with a news prosecutor now saying the writers intended to kidnap and kill elected officials. We've seen a senior justice correspondent, Evan Perez, who is doing this now with much more. And you know, Evan, it was not just a protest filled into the Capitol. As awful as what we saw the day that it happened, we are now seeing, and seeing more clearly, with this information, just how much planning some riots have done. Yeah, for the first time, Adriana, we're hearing from prosecutors telling us some of the stuff that they've uncovered as part of this investigation. And some of this emerging is some of the detention hearings that are going on around the country. After all, this is now a nationwide dragnet, frankly, to try to catch these people who were here in Washington more than a week ago and have now returned home, and they're trying to get them back to Washington so that they can prosecute them. In one case in particular, uh, yesterday in, uh, in the Northern District, uh, a man named Larry Brock was uh, brought before a judge. And one of the things the prosecutor said that uh, one of the they believe he was seen carrying zip ties, and one of the things that they believe was that there was an intention by some of these people to capture members of Congress, to try to perhaps assassinate them. And in particular, the prosecutor talked about a Facebook post by Mr. Brock that's, that called for a second civil war, uh, called for fire and blood and to fight the outcome of the 2020, 2020 election. Obviously, inspired by the words of the president who held a rally on that day just down on the opposite of Pennsylvania Avenue. And so the picture emerged from this case and from others around the country that this is what prosecutors are going after. They believe these people were uh, trying to interrupt the transition power. Uh, this is part of the effort to perhaps build a seditious conspiracy case against some of these people. And that's what we're seeing. So as you pointed out, uh, things could have been a lot worse, right? Uh, the fact is, according to the Washington Post, uh, Vice President Pence was cleared out of uh, the Senate chamber just about 60 seconds before the protesters, which we've now seen pictures of, coming up the stairs and they're distracted by a U.S. Capitol police officer who heroically, frankly, puts himself in a position of danger to draw them away from where uh, these people who are in the, uh, the, the order of session were, were, were standing. So again, a lot more coming out of these court documents indicating uh, how worse this could have been. Evan, thank you so much for bringing us out. Where many of us were shocked, but not surprised. Voted for Trump are on the side of neo-Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan. Watch this. They are allowed to their own opinion. It doesn't mean they're right, but they're allowed to their own opinion. I believe what I said last night. Those people voted the way you voted for who you voted for. I'm just saying. Right, but just because um, you vote for the same people doesn't mean you believe the same thing. Just think about it. You vote for people who have common interests. If someone has a common interest, people who vote like you have common interest is you. That's just how it is. You don't vote so you don't vote for the most liberal person in the world because you're a conservative. You vote for someone who shares your common interest. That's how that's how voting works. So 70 million people are essentially clan members, Congressman. Well, we, we, I hate to say it, we're already used to this type of rhetoric from the left, but we better get used to a, a lot more of it uh, coming in the years ahead. With, with Biden attaining the White House and the Democrats controlling both chambers of the Congress, we're going to hear a lot more of this kind of talk. I don't know if you probably heard AOC last night talk about censoring the media. She actually wants to wipe Fox News off of cable, cable television so that we're forced to watch networks and, and uh, media figures like Don Lemon say just couple things like what you just uh, played on the air. So uh, enough is enough. This is why the American people need to pay attention to what the left is up to. They want to cancel all of us who hold conservative beliefs and views, if we ever supported any part of the agenda or voted for Donald Trump, that's what Don Lemon and the left think of us. And, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a point in, a, in the American political dialogue. We've got to do something more to, to counter it and do something about it. And he also just made justifications for the, you know, there were protests last summer, but there was writing for months. And you know, 
churches set on fire. And it's really the livelihoods that were destroyed as well. And, and again, it's a memory holding of it and a writing history. Yeah, the, the book is consistent about this. All this called out the violence over the summer uh, in, in big cities all over the country. And, and every single one of us called out the violence at Apple last Wednesday on the 6th as well. So while, while we're both very inconsistent and, and hypocritical about uh, these actions too. So uh, this is what, again, this is what we need, we need to get, we hope we never get fully used to it, but get used to this type of rhetoric from the left. And uh, Republicans need to unite around the message that we, we support the First Amendment. We support uh, the ability of every American, no matter what you believe, to seek out uh, whether it's on big tech platform or in the political, uh, the political sphere. That the left will never want us to do that. And that's what will cancel every one of us our ability to, to, to say what we believe, which is very un-American. See, and is that something those senators will see? Uh, I can't say this any better than what the number three Republican Liz Cheney said. Uh, she said that Donald Trump summoned this mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. And it's all on videotape. Uh, we don't have to call in Donald Trump as a witness and say, hey, did you get that speech? We know he made that speech, everyone. I uh, can see it now. Right. We the transcript of what he said. We know there was this violent attack on the Capitol by the domestic terrorists that they killed a police officer that, based on your reporting today, they were 90 feet away from Vice President Pence, who was fighting with his family. They were chanting, hang. Uh, Pence, you actually got to murder his hands on Vice President Pence and his family. What would have happened? We don't have to have a, you know, evidentiary investigation. This is all captured on videotape for the American people to see. So I guess what you're saying is that is one of the plans. They're going to they're gonna make sure the senators see it all that perhaps they didn't see since they had been basically quickly taken away. Well, so first of all, the senators have already seen a lot of this because they experienced it. Uh, some of these senators, um, knew that they were a potential threat of harm. And based on new reporting, we know that some of these domestic terrorists are trying to assassinate elected officials. They were hunting for senators and representatives and vice presidents. And what we also know is that Donald Trump incited these domestic terrorists to do this attack, not because people are unhappy with the corporate tax rate. They were doing this because Congress was going to formalize Donald Trump's defeat and Joe Biden's win. And Donald Bush stop that. How much of the Georgia, it, it, you know, it's interesting, if, if this, my guess is we had six months to go. What he did with Georgia, could you could probably create another article, uh, if you will, essentially, this a second indictment of a, another crime, uh, or another high crime or demeanor. How much do, do you believe Georgia should, in your view, be a part of your case to those uh, senators? That's a great question. The article itself does reference his phone call with the Georgia Secretary of State, where he's going to find 1,780 votes, obviously, to overturn election. And this goes to the whole point of why Washington, D.C. looks like a foreign forces right now. It's because Donald Trump, over two months, spread the big lie that the election was stolen. And his violent supporters, the violent part of the base, believes the election was stolen. And that's why there's no rage bill. They believe Donald Trump is a legitimate president and Joe Biden is illegitimate. If Donald Trump simply says one sentence, the election was not stolen, he could calm down all these tensions by refusing to do so and continuing to complain about that part of his base. So in your since the insurrection on January 6th, they've got to go back on see and change a lot of the plans. So here one also, Brianna, I just want to well, good afternoon, Kettle Land. Continue with snow showers in eastern and south of Kettle Additional accumulations in many of the locations probably take less than an inch, as this is expected to wind down as we go through the later part of this. Uh, good idea. This is not to go out. Abby, no. With the high level of cooperation uh, and with a high level of period. And also in ships might go faster than anyone else now. Because the senators already know that for two months we all experienced on their lives. Was there any thought given to believe one of the ten Republicans voted to impeach as a manager? To help, uh, to, to have the Republicans as one of the impeachment managers? Yeah, that's uh, beyond my pay grade, so I don't know how to answer that job. <laughs> I hear I, I, I take it if one was added, you would accept it? Yes, absolutely, I would. This was the most bipartisan impeachment in U.S. history, and uh, we also expect that we're going to have a, a bipartisan um, amount of senators who uh, will take their votes uh, after their childhood. Right. Well, as you can make up, that was not your decision about who to make the impeachment measure. I was joking. Everybody has a boss. <laughs> not everybody. Uh, no matter what, on various topics at various times. Congressman Ted Lieu, Democrat from California, thank you for coming on and sharing your perspective with us, sir. Thank you, John. You got it. I had growing concern in the capitals across the country that they, too, could be the target of violent protests. The Attorney General of Michigan, who already activated the National Guard in Lansing. And later, America's crisis of misinformation. This is the key. This pipeline is almost as if our drinking water has toxin in it. Not just about social media. How we got to this point? Is there any way to step back from the brink? Susan, I have two, and then two. Things done. We didn't get into all of this overnight. We won't get out of it overnight either. But we will get through it, and we'll get through it together. And today, I'd like to talk more about what that means in uh, sparing no effort. I mean sparing no effort. 
get Americans vaccinated. Hey, we're all ready. We've been, we're quarantining. For a quote, USAA, which are made of COVID than ever before. We're up to between three and 4,000 deaths per day as we approach a grim milestone of 400,000 deaths in America. That's staggering to state the obvious. I know the pain that so many of you are experiencing experiencing right now, starting by sitting down for breakfast this morning and staring at an empty chair around the kitchen table where a loved one used to sit, laugh, talk about how you love one another. I know the frustration that we're all feeling. Almost a year later, we're still far from back to normal. The honest truth is this, things will get worse before they get better. I told you I'll always level with you. You know, and the policy changes that we're going to be making are going to take time to show up in the COVID statistics. And they're not just statistics, it's people's lives. People getting infected today don't show up in case counts for weeks. And those who perish from this disease die weeks after exposure. So it will take time, but I know there are things we can do and we can do them now. For example, the vaccines offer so much hope. And we're grateful for the scientists and researchers and everyone who participated in the clinical trials. We're grateful for the integrity of the process, the rigorous review and testing that's led to millions of people around the world already being vaccinated safely. But the vaccine rollout in the United States has been a dismal failure thus far. And in today's briefing, we discussed five things, five things we'll do in an attempt to turn things around. Five things to turn frustration into motivation. Five things to help us meet our goal of 100 million shots by the end of our first 100 days in office. Some wonder if we're reaching too far for that goal. Is it achievable? It's a legitimate question to ask. Let me be clear. I'm convinced we can get it done. And this is a time to set big goals, to pursue them with courage and conviction, because the health of the nation is literally at stake. First, we will immediately work with states to open up vaccinations to more priority groups. The process of establishing priority groups is driven by science, but the problem is the implementation has been too rigid and confusing. If you were to ask most people today, they couldn't tell you who exactly is getting vaccinated. What they do know is there are tens of millions of doses of vaccine sitting unused in freezers around the country, while people who want and need the vaccine can't get it. We'll fix the problem by encouraging states to allow more people to get vaccinated beyond health care workers and move through those groups as quickly as they think we can. That includes anyone 65 years or older, a population that has accounted for over 80 percent of the deaths to date, 80 percent of the deaths to date. We also have to continue vaccinating frontline essential workers like educators, first responders, grocery work, store workers, etc. It won't mean that everyone in this group will get vaccinated immediately, as the supply is not where it needs to be. But it will mean that vaccines become available, as they can become available, will reach more people who need them, will reach out and get the vaccine used. The second thing we're going to change if we're getting more people vaccinated, then we need more vaccination sites. That's where we're going to harness the full resources of the federal government to establish thousands of community vaccination centers. On my first day in office, I'll instruct the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, to begin setting up the first of these centers. By the end of our first month in office, we'll have 100 federally supported centers across the nation that will ultimately vaccinate millions of people. 
Think of places that are convenient and accessible. School gymnasiums, sports stadiums, community centers. We've already had productive conversations with bipartisan groups of county officials, mayors, governors, tribal leaders, leaders of the private sector who shared their ideas with us about this effort. And as we build them, we're going to make sure it's done equitably. We're going to make sure there are vaccination centers in communities hit hardest by the pandemic, in black and Latino communities and rural communities as well. Within the first month of our administration, we're going to deploy mobile clinics, mobile clinics moving from community to community that will partner with community health centers and local primary care doctors to offer vaccines to hard hit and hard to reach communities in cities, small towns, and in rural communities. And to staff up these centers, we will mobilize thousands of clinical and non-clinical professionals. Think of the people deployed that we deploy in natural disasters. Experts from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, from FEMA, and the Center of Disease Control, our Public Health Service Com uh, Commission Corps, our military medical personnel, our first responders. Additionally, we're going to expand the pool of medical professionals, including retired health care workers, who can administer the vaccine and to ensure we have enough vaccinators to meet the nation's needs as we ramp this up. And as governors of both parties have asked, our administration will reimburse states 100% when their National Guard is deployed in the fight against COVID. We'll provide resources to help states cover the cost of personnel, vaccinators, administrative staff, as well as supplies like dry ice and laptops and protective equipment. The third change we're going to make is we're going to fully activate the, pharmaceutical, the, the pharmacies across the country to get the vaccination into more arms as quickly as possible. Millions of Americans now turn to the local pharmacies every day for their medicines, flu shots, and much more. We're going to immediately start new major efforts, working directly with both independent and chain pharmacies to get Americans vaccinated. This program will extend, expand beyond access in neighborhoods across, country, across the country so that we can make, you can make an appointment and get your shot conveniently show up at a particular time and get it done quickly. The fourth thing we're going to do is we're going to use the full strength of the federal government to ramp up supply of the vaccines. As I said before, we'll use the Defense Production Act to work with private industry to accelerate the making of materials needed to supply and administer the vaccine from the tubes and, syringe and syringes to protective equipment. And I've already asked the team and we have identified the suppliers who are prepared to work with, their, with our teams, and we're going to work with their teams. Not someday we're going to go do this. When I say we're going to do, invoke the Defense Production Act, I said, go out, even though we don't have the authority, now go out and identify those companies that are prepared and will be able to do what we're going to ask. As we made clear earlier this month, the Trump administration's policy of holding and mark globally in deaths, closing in on the 400,000 policy of holding back close to half the supply of the vaccines available did not make sense. Our administration will release the vast majority of the vaccines when they are available so more people can get vaccinated quickly while still retaining a small reserve for any unseen shortage or delays. But let me be clear. We are not changing the FDA's recommendation and its recommended dosing schedules. We believe it's critical that everyone should get two doses within the FDA recommended time frame. So we're not doing away with that, that availability. Fifth, we will always be honest and transparent about where we stand, both the good news as well as the bad. We're going to make sure state and local officials know how much supply they'll be getting and when they can expect to get it so they can plan. Right now we're hearing that they can't plan because they don't know how much supply of vaccines they can expect and what time frame. 
That stops when we're in office. We're also promised to provide regular updates to you, the American people, on our progress and our goals. We will be, I promise you, transparent about the decisions we are making and why we're making the decisions. You're entitled to know. Our administration will lead with science and sciences, with the, with the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health, that will be free and totally free from political influence. A Surgeon General who's independent and speaks directly to the American people. The FDA, whose decisions are based on science and science alone, speaking directly to you. Look, while millions of Americans have already gotten the vaccine and millions more are already to get it, we also know we need to address vaccine hesitancy and build trust in many communities. We know that's the case, for example, in black, Latino, and Native American communities. People who have not always been treated with dignity and honesty they deserve by the federal government and the scientific community throughout our history. We also see that disinformation campaigns are already underway to further undermine trust in the vaccines. Our administration will launch a massive public education campaign to rebuild that trust. We'll help people understand what science tells us, that the vaccines help reduce the risk of COVID infections and can better safeguard our health and the health of our families and our communities. It's a critical piece to account for a tragic reality of the disproportionate impact this virus has had on black, Latinos, and Native American people who are being infected about four times the rate of white Americans and dying at only three times the rate of white Americans. This is unacceptable. It's unconscionable. Equity is central to our COVID response. And the Vice President and I commit to making sure communities of color and rural neighborhoods, those living with disabilities and seniors are not left behind in our vaccination plans. Look, our plan is as clear as it is bold. Get more people vaccinated for free. Create more places for them to get vaccinated. Mobilize more medical teams to get the shots in people's arms. Increase supply and get it out the door as soon as possible. This will be one of the most challenging operational efforts ever undertaken by our country. But you have my word that we will manage the hell out of this operation. But as I said last night, we need funding from Congress to make this happen. And I'm optimistic. I'm convinced that the American people are ready to spare no effort and no expense to get this done. All these steps will take some time. It may take many months to get where we need to be. There will be stumbles. And yes, I know so much has already been asked of you. And when we're sworn in next week, we're going to ask you to keep the faith and keep following what we know works. One of our 100-day challenges is to mask up everyone. The day we're inaugurated, I'm going to ask you to mask up for the next 100 days. This is not a political issue. And I will issue an executive order to require a mask where I have the authority to do that. In federal worker, for federal workers, in federal property, on interstate travel, like trains and planes. We'll also be working with mayors and governors in red states and blue states and, require ma and ask them to require masking up in their cities and their states. Look, I hope we now know this is not a political issue. This is about saving lives. I know it's become a partisan issue, but what a stupid, stupid thing for it to happen. This is a patriotic act. We're asking you. We're in a war with this virus. And experts say and have shown that wearing a mask from now until April will save as many as 50,000 lives. Quite frankly, it was shocking to see members of the Congress while the Capitol was under siege by a deadly mob of thugs refusing to wear a mask while they were in secure locations. 
I'm so proud of my congressman right here in the state of Delaware, Lisa Brown Rochester, trying to hand out masks while people are lying on the floor, huddled up, and a Republican college refusing to put them on. What the hell is the matter with them? It's time to grow up. The result? At least four members of Congress to date, including a cancer survivor, now have COVID-19 who are in those rooms. For God's sake, wear a mask, if not for yourself, for your loved ones, for your country. These are real matters of life and death. We need you to stick with hand washing, social distancing. And avoid indoor gatherings with people outside your own household. We'll be a partner to the states and cities. So where things are working, we'll help do more of the good work. And when things can improve, we'll bring more resources to bear to get folks tested and vaccinated. I promise you, we're going to work closely with nonprofits. For soft, balanced skin, find the one, Neutrogena. Tomorrow, let's start today. Al's goal, total wellness. He teams up with an expert to show you how to work out smart, eat healthy, and boost your immunity. You want to get fit? Don't use any excuses. Hashtag start today. Does anybody want breakfast? Guys? Let's go. Guys! I'm leaving for McDonald's in five seconds. Why didn't you start with that? Oh, oh, Get a one dollar any size. Donald Trump are the main threats. Mayor Bowser, do you Today, DC's mayor, police, oh, Secret Service, and others trying to reassure a nervous country the inauguration will go well. All of our officers will be on hand to participate in ensuring a peaceful day. New 12-foot fencing with concrete bases around the Capitol complex. The National Mall officially closed until after the inauguration. Threats being monitored across the country. At least a dozen states have activated the National Guard to secure their capitals. We have so many assets inside the Penn Quarter Capital area that there is the potential for people to go elsewhere, whether it's back to their state capitals or to other parts of the city. Few specific threats, the FBI says, but lots of worrying chatter. We are seeing an extensive amount uh, of concerning online chatter. Now, nine days after the storming of the Capitol building, we're learning how much worse things could have been. Federal prosecutors allege there is strong evidence that the intent of the Capitol rioters was to capture and assassinate elected officials. The government said the evidence was not direct, but they are pursuing it based on evidence they have. That allegation from a court filing against this man, Jacob Chansley, whose lawyer places the blame squarely on President Trump. He was there at the invitation of our president. Chansley is one of around 100 suspects charged, according to federal officials. There are around 300 cases opened by U.S. investigators. And a terrifying new revelation. The Washington Post reporting that Vice President Mike Pence was even closer to the rioters than previously known. The Post reporting that as this heroic officer led rioters away from the Senate chamber, Pence and his family were less than a hundred feet away in another room, reportedly staying out of the view of the mob by mere seconds. DC police officers are now describing their terrifying ordeals to CNN. Now it's beaten from like every direction. Uh, and then tased a number of times on the back of my neck. And then some guys started getting a hold of my gun and uh, they were screaming out, um, you know, kill him with his own gun. Officer Daniel Hodges was brutally crushed in a doorway as rioters charged in. There's a guy ripping my mask off and he, uh, he, he was able to rip away my baton and beat me with it. And, um, you know, he was practically foaming at the mouth. Just incredible and infuriating stories there. Now, Jake, we've also just learned that two days before the insurrection at the Capitol, a memo was sent to members of Congress banning tours of the congressional buildings on January 6th. That's the day of the election certification. Now, since then, some Democrats have accused Republican members of helping the insurrectionists by giving them tours before that rioting. 
Democratic Representative Mikey Sherrill, she called them reconnaissance missions. Now, there's no proof so far that Republican members were complicit, but a law enforcement official does tell CNN that they are looking into the possibility that those Republicans unwittingly helped give people who were later part of that mob a lay of the land. Jake? Pretty stunning. Alex Marquardt, thanks so much. Joining us now, Democratic Congressman Anthony Brown of Maryland. He's a retired colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve. Uh, Congressman, thanks so much for joining us. Speaker Pelosi today. On comes uh, Mississippi Senator Roger Wicker, who wants to know uh, from all the social media companies about the pile-on to silence uh, that crowd, that speech, that point of view. Uh, he hasn't gotten any answers, just sent the missives out. The senator with us right now. Good to have you, Senator. So you're trying to get to the bottom of this, right? What what made them decide to not only take down anything having to do with Donald Trump, but oftentimes those even remotely associated with Donald Trump or his speeches? Neil, thank you for having me on. Yes, this, this is bigger than Donald Trump, and it's even bigger than the 25 million conservative uh, people who, who have chosen voluntarily to use parlor. Uh, we're, we're getting uh, outrage uh, from the right and the left. I mean, there's a reason that our allies in Europe are, are frightened about this. There's a reason the socialist president of Mexico has spoken out about this, the ACLU. Uh, this is, uh, th this is a, a frightening, troubling uh, misuse of, of the power of these big techs. And yes, we are, we are most interested in getting answers. Uh, when did they decide so, to do but this? But Senator, is, it, is part of it these companies, uh, Pat Dorsey says it's bigger than Donald Trump, hinting that this is going to go wider than Donald Trump. What did you make of well, that? It, it, it already is bigger than Donald Trump, and, and, uh, but, but it, it amounts to a stifling of, of free speech. And, and, and so, I mean, they're opening themselves up. We're, we're certainly going to keep talking about this Section 230 liability. I mean, at, at this point, there is absolutely no reason why they shouldn't operate like Neil Cavuto has to do. You, you, you say what the, you believe the truth is, and you take your chances under the First Amendment. They have a special protection under the statute uh, that people of the right and left are going to want to, to re-examine that. Uh, but also, we're, you know, we're about to spend billions of dollars building out broadband and making it easier for these people uh, to, to connect with Americans. Uh, I think we have to ask, uh, don't they have some obligation to make sure that they don't stifle information and stifle free speech? When a strong man goes into a third world country and takes over in a coup d'etat, the first thing they do is go to the information centers. They take over the television stations. In this case, the left has taken over uh, a large part of the way Americans communicate. And, and yes, we need to know that they collude with each other. Who did, who did Dorsey and Zuckerberg and Bikai, who did they all talk to before making these collective decisions? It's, it's, um, it's a coincidence. Do you think, Senator, and, that they, they took this calculated risk? They took this risk. Um, maybe some have been very, you know, nonchalant about saying it was legal cover, your, your, you know what, with some of the harsh, violent language, and they wanted to get ahead of that if it happens in the future, and they were to be sued if something were even worse happened. Another point of view is uh, Republicans aren't in power. Pretty soon uh, you won't have the Senate, you won't have the White House, you don't have the House, and they roll the dice to say more Republicans are upset at this than our Democrats. And this appeals to Democrats who aren't keen on your point of view anyway. What do you say to that? It, it, it may appeal to Democrats at, at this particular moment in time. But listen, I've seen majorities come and go. I was a member of the Senate when there were only 40 Republicans. And I've been a member of the Senate mm -hmm. when there were 54 of us. Uh, elections come and go. People retire. Uh, majorities change. This is about the First Amendment. And if this, if this doesn't send a chill up the spines of people, uh, our left-wing friends who wanted to uh, defend the First Amendment, then it ought to. Uh, the, the majority will change. Are you surprised that as of, yet, as of yet it really doesn't? 
I don't, I don't know about that, but I know obviously there's a lot going on in Washington. But I, it, I am disappointed that there is not more outrage from some of our elected officials. I'm glad to see voices that have spoken out in favor of, of free speech when it's popular and when it's unpopular. And I'm glad to see people internationally condemning this. But we have. No, you're right. It's an eclectic group. But from conservative leaders, Angela Merkel, the leader of Britain, um, the leader of Mexico, it's you're quite right. It's universal. We'll watch it very closely. Senator Wicker, be safe yourself. Be well. Senator Roger Wicker, the beautiful state of Mississippi. Thank you for calling uh, for calling that, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, in the meantime, one of the things that he has to pay and uh, take the reins of. Uh, of being vice president. I just want to follow up on what Matt said. He's absolutely correct about just the physical security of the Capitol and the challenge, and his his reporting has been so crucial on this, the challenge uh, that the Park Police and the Secret Service and the Capitol Police and the FBI have. I'm in the Capitol right now, and I can tell you, I don't under I don't underestimate people who want to do bad things, but I, I could tell you that it is very difficult to get into this building right now. Um, and I you can't walk I mean, this, what, the, the image you're seeing here is, I believe, that second or third street um, uh, that runs across the mall about two or three blocks from the Capitol. I have to enter the Capitol every day by going three or four blocks out of the way, going through at least three or four checkpoints. I park in a in a garage in the Capitol. It is nearly impossible. It takes me about 30 minutes to get into the garage. I, I just have a very hard time believing um, that uh, anybody is getting anywhere close to this complex right now. It's just, it's a complete fortress um, that is no fun to get anywhere near. And, and, and that's not just sort of difficult for the inauguration process, but I keep telling people, you've got 700,000 people who live in Washington, D.C. They are essentially living yeah. in a city under siege because of last week's terror attack. Um, one of the things that we've also sort of found out as we find more information out about this attack is, again, the calls are coming from inside the House. NBC has a story right now talking about the fact that you have members of Congress who are legitimately concerned that they might be attacked by staffers or other Congress members on the Republican side. Um, you know, Matt, I want your thoughts on this because, you know, when you have members of Congress who say, hey, I want to bring in my guns, I don't care what anybody else says. When you have members of Congress who may or may not have uh, brought some of these terrorists into the building in advance, when you have members of Congress who have said, you know, basically kill the rabbit, blah, 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 they want this country burned to the ground, how realistic is it to think that anybody can go back to work with someone who they think is going to shoot them? I mean, we'll see, right? The relationship in Congress, I covered the Justice Department, so maybe I'm not the best person to speak to this, but the relationship in Congress between Democrats and Republicans has been broken for a long time, and it seems like it's especially broken now when you have Democratic lawmakers saying that they sort of fear their own colleagues. They fear that their own colleagues or their colleague staffers might have participated in some sort of reconnaissance before the events of January 6th. Now, I think the evidence on that is still pretty limited, right? It's a far cry from someone doing a congressional tour to doing reconnaissance. That's one thing maybe that law enforcement will go down the road of exploring. But look, the effects of this are gonna stick with us beyond just January 20th too, right? We'll see what security measures stay in place, especially for, for the Capitol after January. We'll see what additional security measures other government buildings might get after January 20th. You know, this event, I think, is raising a lot of, um, you know, it's pointing out how badly the system can fail, and so maybe we need to change some of it. And the result being that we still have more limited access uh, to our leaders, which is always a shame. Jake Sherman, Matt Zapatosky, and Kurt Bardella, thank you all so very much for joining us today. When we come back, Politics is going to look a lot different starting next week. Thank goodness how Americans, specifically Republicans, are preparing for a post-Trump world. Daddy? Yeah? Where's Peter? Well, sweetie, he's your great-great-grandfather. Here, does he look like me? Yeah. Your family's story is waiting to be shared at Ancestry.com. All right, I brought in Ensure Max Protein to give you the protein you need. With less of the sugar, you don't. I'll take that. 30 grams of protein and one gram of sugar. Ensure Max Protein with nutrients to support immune health. 
We all have our own journey ahead of us, our own hopes and dreams. We'll pass many milestones, moments that define you and drive you to achieve even more. So celebrate everyone, because success isn't just about where you want to get to, it's also about how you get there. Cut on rehearsal. The all-new 2021 Cadillac Escalade never stop arriving. I want to break free. Like hundreds of millions of servants. I want to break free. I was trapped. To my I got out, Baram. What is it that you want to do? I would have to become the creature. It gets born only once every generation. The white tiger. We did our. If you printed out directions to get here today, you're in the right place. My seminars are a great tool to help young homeowners who are turning into their parents. Now remember, they're not programs, they're TV shows. You woke up early, no one cares. Yes? So I was using something called Home Quote Explorer from Progressive to easily compare home insurance rates. Was I hashtagging? Progressive can't help you from becoming your parents, but we can help you compare rates on home insurance with Home Quote Explorer. Guess what? The waiter doesn't need to know your name. It, for pain relief, don't just block the pain with ordinary patches and creams. Help heal the pain with Thermacare. Real therapeutic heat increases blood flow to help accelerate healing. So you not only feel better, you get better. Thermacare. Real heat, real healing. Ocean Spray works with nature every day to keep you healthy. I can barely see the road. I should have left earlier. You gotta change your schedule with the weather in the winter. Normally, if it takes you 15 minutes to work, if the roads are bad, give yourself an extra 15. We're trying to do our best and as fast as we can so you guys can make it to work. If you're starting to see cars in the ditch and in the median, the roads are bad, so please slow down. Remember to slow down and please don't crowd the plow. Introducing super leak-proof underwear from NYX. The most absorbent period undies ever. They look and feel and machine wash just like regular underwear. Leave that trash behind. Switch to super leak-proof underwear at NYX.com. Medical school is very stressful. I lost a lot of hair during that time. Nutribull is 100% drug-free and is natural. You can't argue with clinical proof. Start your hair growth journey at Nutribull.com. There are just five days left in Trump's presidency, and the message from the American people to Trump appears to be, don't let the door hit you on the rear on your way out. Trump is set to leave the White House Wednesday after stealing as many things as possible from the final time as president. This, as a new poll from the Washington Post and ABC News, says that 56% of Americans want Congress to bar Trump from ever running for office again. Trump will also be the first president to never achieve majority approval at any point in his four years in office. And as for the president's party, he's led all these years. They've lost Congress and dozens of lawmakers are already being blacklisted by corporate America. And the GOP brand is basically radioactive and trash in large swaths of the country. Let's bring in to discuss Rick Wilson, a GOP strategist and co-founder of the Lincoln Project, and Phil Rucker, Washington Post, White House Bureau Chief, and an MSNBC political analyst. I will start with you, the notorious Rick Wilson, uh, who I, I feel like I should slap on a, a, a banner that says, warning, explicit lyrics. Uh, Rick, I want to hear... I want to play the latest ad from the Lincoln Project, and, and I want you to I want you to sort of explain to the audience what you guys are really shooting for when we get back about this new ad uh, about Rick Scott. Rick Scott here. I have just now taken over as chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. I now have to figure out how to raise roughly a gazillion dollars in order to retake the U.S. Senate and stop the march of socialism and the destruction of the American people. Take them off! If we can take that place, and then do what? So, Rick, what's the message you're trying to get across here? Not that we haven't already picked it up. Well, 
Rick Scott was one of the members of the Sedition Caucus who backed the false uh, conspiracy theory that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, which helped inflame a violent mob. They, people like Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, and Rick Scott poured gasoline all over the country, essentially, uh, by, by promoting this conspiracy theory that Donald Trump had won the election uh, through uh, weeks and weeks since the election, backing up his every statement. And when Donald Trump struck the match this week, or last week, on Wednesday, and an armed insurgent force entered the Capitol with murderous intent who killed a police officer, guys like Rick Scott are still dug in. They're still saying nothing's changed, business as usual. We're going to fight socialism with the, you know, the magical the magical enemy of the, of the Republican Party, the imaginary socialist army, um, while they've got an army of insurgents who have killed people in this country who are still tuned up and ready to go. So corporate America is going to be one of the things Rick Scott has to go to to tell them, I need your support to rebuild the Republican Party and recapture the majority. We want to make sure that corporate America makes a decision. They have to tell the Republicans like Rick Scott and Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz, you're either with us as a, in this country, or you're with these insurgents and these people who try to overthrow a free and fair election. And it's going to be a tough spot because on the one hand, they have to keep the MAGAs happy. On the other hand, they know that America thinks it's bad branding to be in favor of insurgency and, and, and violent revolution against uh, against a free election. To offer his aid and his congratulations. Now, while some folks out there seem to think this is worth sending Pence a muffin basket, we should note this only happened one week before the inauguration, two months late, and only after those election lies that he tolerated resulted in a deadly attack by MAGA terrorists, terrorists who were actually seeking to assassinate Pence himself. Still, still, the call is a sign that the transition of power will take place in five days, even though President Trump continues to reject reality, as CNN's Caitlin Collins reports. During his final days in the White House, President Trump is planning an early exit. Instead of attending his successor's inauguration, CNN has learned Trump will leave Washington early Wednesday following a military send-off and plans to be in Florida by the time Joe Biden is sworn in. Now I'm going to the inauguration. Maybe that's best now, given the situation we're in. Trump was against the idea of leaving D.C. as an ex-president, meaning he'll get one last flight on Air Force One and won't need Biden's permission to use a government jet. Military aides will have two nuclear footballs ready, one that will fly with Trump and one that will be with Biden. Once Biden is sworn in, Trump's launch codes will no longer work. With five days left in office, Trump is watching his presidency unravel after being impeached for inciting a deadly insurrection on Capitol Hill. He's leaving the White House with the lowest approval rating of his presidency, after it fell to 29% in the latest poll conducted by Pew Research, which also found that two-thirds of Americans don't want Trump to remain a major national political figure. We should never, as a party, let a person be more powerful than our party. Sources say the president's advisors have casually discussed him resigning. But Trump shut the conversation down immediately and banned all mentions of Richard Nixon, who resigned in 1974 before he could be impeached and possibly convicted. Instead of following in Nixon's footsteps, Trump will face a second impeachment trial. Although House Speaker Nancy Pelosi declined to give details on when that trial will happen today. I find this to be a very emotional time. I said to the members, we're very passionate to our reaction to this assault on our democracy. As National Guard troops flooded Washington, Vice President Mike Pence has filled the typical role taken by a president during a time of crisis, as Trump has mostly remained behind closed doors. Ten weeks after the election, Pence finally called Vice President-elect Kamala Harris for the first time yesterday. And Jake, that is the highest level of contact that there has been between these two administrations with Mike Pence. Finally, t over 10 weeks later, calling the vice president-elect to talk about this. We are told it was a cordial conversation. And of course, that comes as the president himself still has not spoken 
to Joe Biden, even though he is going to take office and take over the administration from him in just a matter of days. But meanwhile, the president did stay behind closed doors today, but we did see Mike Lindell, who is the CEO of MyPillow, of course, someone who is a close ally of the president's. You'll remember some of the controversial comments he made in the early days of the pandemic. We saw him walking into the Oval Office, or into the West Wing, I should say, earlier today, and a Washington Post photographer got a close-up of the notes that he was carrying with him. And Jake, when you zoom in on them, you can see that he is talking about the election. Things like martial law are mentioned. Uh, the words taken immediately to save the Constitution. He is naming that pro-Trump attorney, Sidney Powell, who of course spread so many lies about the election. And he also talks about moving Cash Patel, who is currently the chief of staff, to the acting defense secretary, to the CIA, to acting CIA. Of course, that means uh, that could imply some potential changes that could be happening at CIA. That's something the president has considered in his final days in office. But Jake, if this is someone who met with the president, something we have not determined yet, it does go to show what those conversations could be about. Just utter lunacy. Utter lunacy. All right, Caitlin Collins, thanks so much. Uh, let's bring in our panel. Uh, and, and Abby, let me start with you. I mean, the guy from my pillow is carrying documents and talking to President Trump, presumably about declaring martial law and all sorts of other crazy stuff. Um, I mean, this is not going to be over it's until January 20th. And even then, these traitors are going to be around. Yeah, I mean, it's mind-blowing what is going on here. A week after uh, a failed insurrection or a failed coup attempt, uh, incited by this kind of conspiracy, conspiracy theory uh, nonsense, the White House is still inviting into the West Wing uh, a purveyor of these uh, lies. And I, I think it's really shocking at this point uh, that there is just no one around. I mean, I, I think we know at this point most of the White House aides have already departed, moved on to their next gigs or their next things, and they've left the, the president to his own devices. And people like the my pillow guy are filling the gap with all of this nonsense about potential last-ditch efforts to uh, declare m martial law before he is no longer president. It's ridiculous, but it also should be outrageous, and it should underscore the degree to which uh, there is no bottom here for this president. We just keep going lower and lower. And I don't know what extent to which it's, it's criminal, honestly. I mean, they tried to stage a coup last week, and Jackie, I mean, the best case scenario, the best thing that you can say is that maybe they didn't intend anybody to kill anybody. They didn't intend anybody to vandalize. Maybe they just intended there to be so much intimidation that the vice president and the House and Senate didn't do their constitutional job. That's the best interpretation you right. can offer. And here you have martial law being discussed. General Flynn is still out there saying all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, right. I mean, the president is self-soothing in probably the most destructive way possible. Uh, the other thing he's, um, the few people that are still around him are doing, which we reported today at Daily Beast, is uh, they're, they're presenting him with polls showing that Republicans still, uh, majority Republicans, uh, support him, which is true. It's just everyone else doesn't and thinks that he should leave. Uh, and so the, the comforting of himself should not be a surprise to anyone who's been paying attention. And obviously, this, of course, we knew this was going to happen. We just didn't know how. It undermines the message that he sent just the other day in that, um, you know, late video uh, about in the peaceful transfer of power. And that's what he would be focused on. Well, it's very clear he is not focused on that. And he's still, you know, again, self-soothing with these lies that caused an insurrection at the United States Capitol. So we should note, Abby, these lies, it's not just President Trump's fault. He is the main instigator. He is the main inciter. But it is House Republicans led by Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise, Senate Republicans like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz, the, all of the MAGA media, including the Murdochs, all the way to, to, to Bannon. I mean, is there going to be any acceptance of what these people have uh, and, and repentance for what these people have unleashed on the country? You know, one of the reasons that it's seeming increasingly unlikely that there will be is because of what Jackie just talked about. You know, the polls seem to indicate that Republicans are all in 
on these lies. Uh, the rank and file Republicans, a shocking number of them, believe these lies. And it's because uh, they've been indoctrinated by their own party and now the tail is gonna wag the dog. Republicans and elected, official, uh, and elected officials are gonna look at these polls and say, see, we can't, uh, we can't go back on this yep. now. And it's because they started it and created this mess that they're in. An absolute destructive destruction of the, in the integrity of the thinking in this country. Abby and Jackie, thanks to both of you. And you can join Abby for a CNN special report Kamala Harris making history that Sunday at 10 p.m. here on CNN. In the health lead, as the Biden administration prepares to take over the vaccine rollout, the Trump administration is facing new questions about its promise to release doses from a reserve stockpile that actually doesn't seem to exist. As CNN's Alexandra Fields, uh, Field reports for us now, the supply issues come as the U.S. reached its deadliest 14-day stretch of the pandemic so far. A promise to get more Americans vaccinated more quickly seemingly falling short. This week, the Trump administration announced it would release a reserve supply of second doses of the vaccine. We can now ship all of the doses that had been held in physical reserve. But at the time of that announcement, many of those doses had already been released, according to... Genuine Idaho potatoes, not just a side... Learn some lessons from the playbook that we saw on display in Georgia. Invest in programs and organizing programs run by black and brown women across this country who know how to invest in voters. And I think that's something that we've seen Jamie do um, in his home state of South Carolina, even in different programs where he actively engaged communities that are typically ignored by elected officials, typically ignored as voters. And he made sure that they got attention, they were heard, and they turned out to the polls. So I feel like that, above all, is his number one, number one goal here. I think number two is absolutely listening to all parts of the party. There are, like you mentioned in that New York Times story, he has to hear progressives, he has to hear moderates, and he has to make sense of it all. What he has going into this role, though, is strong relationships with state party leaders across the country, and that's going to be a massive asset for him as he navigates this terrain. Rev, really quickly, I, I tend to disagree with some of these analysis that say that the party is that split. I think that there are lots of Democrats and lots of independents who believe that you can still push forward policy and hold Trump and his cronies accountable. When it comes to messaging, though, that may be a challenge. If you were talking to, to Jamie Harrison right now, what would you say is the first message that Democrats need to have in that first 100 days when they'll still be dealing with impeachment and trying to push through policy for COVID? I would uh, have as a message that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We must move forward uh, in terms of dealing with the pandemic, in terms of preserving some of the things like the Affordable Care Act, police reform, and some of the things that we dealt with in 2020 from George Floyd on, and at the same time prosecute those that have broke the law. And I think that Jamie is uniquely qualified to know how to strike that balance. I agree with you when you say you don't think there's as great a divide as some of the media plays. People want to see bread on the table and the guy that broke in their house go to jail at the same time. School of Business Professor Dave Dodson on this. Uh, Dave, where do you think this goes? They will have a friendlier crowd in Washington that uh, pretty much to a branch is okay with this idea of a $15 wage. Well, look, Neil, it could not come at a worse possible time. You know, we have to be mindful of what the stimulus bill is supposed to do. And it's supposed to help certain people who've been affected get back to work. And most importantly, certain companies that have been deeply affected reopening. And by slamming $15 an hour minimum wage, this sort of macro policy on an emergency time couldn't happen at a worse possible time. Now, look, you don't you, you can get any guest you want to come on the show and some some report about minimum wage laws. You just have to use common sense and think about it from the standpoint of a business owner. If you're a restaurant owner, one third of your it's uh, one third of your cost is labor and you're deciding whether to open how many hours to have. How many people did I want to have on the staff? Whether I'm going to do overtime, and now all of a sudden my labor costs are up 25%. You cannot tell me that that's not going to affect how many people you bring back. Secondly, and this actually may be the real critical issue, is that restaurant owners, and by the way, this affects 50% of the people affected are in the restaurant business. Restaurant owners have had a horrendous nine months and a really bad December, and many of them are wondering whether they're going to open at all. And part of the calculus here is that they've got a whole bunch of back debt that they owe, they have debt that they have, and they have bills that they have to pay. And now we're saying, oh, by the way, 
when you are most fragile, we're going to kick you in the teeth and raise your labor costs. What's going to happen is they're just going to say, you know what, I'm just not going to open. And if you think about it, Professor, there already is a $50 wage or close to it in a lot of cities. Um, so it, it's different strokes for different folks in, in, in markets and all that demand it. A lot of uh, companies have found that unless they were paying that much, they were just going to be beat down by someone else who was. So that's fine. But I mean, if you're in a rural area or a state where these uh, costs are not nearly as high, there ought to be some flexibility to it, right? Neil, that's exactly right. I mean, this really is to a large extent a rural, worth, rural versus urban issue, right? Because uh, 29 states in the D.C. Uh, uh, District of Columbia already have minimum wage laws that are higher than the federal minimum wage law. But if you look at where those are located, it's really a blue state, red state issue where blue states who are largely not going to be affected by this are imposing minimum wage on states that don't have one now and can't afford it because it doesn't cost the same to live in Greenwich, Connecticut, as, as, it, as it costs to live in Biloxi, Mississippi. And this kind of notion of macro nanny state economics, where we're going to decide what the wage should be across the whole United States without thinking about those regional differences, is insane. All right, Professor Dave Dotson, strongly sp spoken, my friend. Thank you very, very much uh, from the Stanford School of Business. Dave Dotson. All right, in the meantime, we told you at the beginning of the hour how Joe Biden wants to get more COVID doses out to Americans quickly. What is left out of that is he's essentially federalizing that effort. A lot of states have had mixed results in getting it out. So if he federalizes that, what are the impact of that? We'll be exploring that tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern, Don Cavuto Live, also looking at the security efforts that are building, as are the number of soldiers there, to prepare for a safe and peaceful, well, inauguration. That's the hope. Here's the fight. Hello, everybody. I'm Jesse Waters, along with Juan Williams, Dana Perino, Tyrus, and Emily Campagno. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. It's an all-out effort to stifle and shut down conservatives. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey caught on leaked video suggesting that his company plans to go much farther than just Golden by last week's siege of the U.S. Capitol. Also breaking, CNN has just obtained a joint bulletin from the Homeland Security Department, the FBI, and eight other agencies warning that domestic extremists pose the most likely threat to the presidential inauguration, especially those who believe uh, the incoming administration is illegitimate. Meanwhile, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia says 275 cases have been opened in the investigation into the Capitol insurrection. All of this as federal prosecutors allege in a filing that some of the rioters intended to, quote, capture and kill elected officials. Who are more than 5,400 employees and are nearly the same words Jack shared in a recent tweet thread offering. All 44 federal charges filed so far are in action. More than 100 arrests, as many as 300 case files expected to be opened by the day's end. Over 140,000 tips have come in to help law enforcement identify those who captured, of course, the Capitol for a time and who were, uh, in their own way, captured on camera as they stormed Congress, some of them with every intention of harming elected officials or worse. Today, a pair of disturbing new reports in the Post detailing the greatest detail yet in the ferocity with which the mob rioted. This is according to on-the-ground witnesses. D.C. police officers speaking out as well, saying they feared the worst was happening as they sought to protect the Capitol and those inside from a swarm of Trump supporters. That includes Michael Fanoni, pictured here in the thick of the mob outside the Capitol, captured by rioters. He relays the evidence against them, saying they shouted, kill him with his own gun, end quote. While Commander Ramey Kyle tells the Post, we all believe we were fighting for our lives. Another officer, Daniel Hodges, pictured in a violent standoff that you see there, described in real time how he had to calculate what to do to try to stop an uprising from becoming a massacre. Quote, The investigation, let's get all the players out. We're literally learning new stuff every day. And there's one thing I can tell you, as, as a brother, the last thing I ever want to see is a speedy trial. Nothing ever good comes from a speedy trial. <laughs> in my entire life experience, in my forefathers, I'm not for it. I, I think it's sad.
<laughs> yeah, you want to support due process. And Emily, um, it's the statement that we saw him make on this leak. We are coming, we will be there, but we are preparing as if they are. Serious questions are now being asked about the intent of some rioters during the Capitol siege. Federal prosecutors in Arizona say there is evidence rioters intended to, quote, capture and assassinate elected officials. The man who told them that, they say, Jacob Chansley, who wore a headdress and face paint and carried a spear, and who's now in custody. But the acting U.S. attorney for Washington, D.C., says this. There is no direct evidence at this point in kill capture teams and assassination. Still, federal prosecutors in Texas say this man, retired Air Force reservist Larry Brock, photographed carrying zip-tie-like restraints inside the Capitol, may have intended to use them to restrain people he viewed as enemies, presumably lawmakers. Brock has said he picked the restraints up off the ground and intended to give them to a police officer. The Washington Post reports the mob came closer than was previously known to Vice President Pence. The Post says as the rioting mob made its way through the... Uh, the slightest modicum of caring about it. In fact, what about the San Bernardino shooting? Don't you remember how at that time privacy was all of a sudden so important to big tech that they wouldn't... Claimed 15 more lives in South Dakota. That is according to the latest report from the DOH. COVID-19 has claimed a total of 1,629 lives in the state so far. Officials reporting 425 new cases with active cases setting at more than 4,700. The number of people currently hospitalized by the disease fell by 20, that number now at 227. Officials say more than 44,000 South Dakotans have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. In Iowa, the total number of Iowans hospitalized with COVID-19 is the lowest it has been since October. Hospitalizations in Iowa have been up and down over the last few weeks, but have steadily declined since mid-November when there were more than 1,500 people that were hospitalized. Elsewhere in our region, North Dakota's Department of Health confirming 233 new cases of the virus and eight deaths in the state. Minnesota continues to show relatively positive trend lines on key metrics in, for COVID-19, including new cases and hospitalizations, which has dropped by more than half over the past four weeks. Today marks one year to the day since the virus was first diagnosed in America, and health officials say that we're in worse shape now than ever before. In the last two weeks, more than half of the states have seen COVID deaths surge by more than 20%. This is anger grows coast to coast over the slow vaccine rollout, and now NBC's Aaron McLaughlin reports that evidence is some are gaming the system and jumping the line. This morning, in the face of nationwide delays and long lines, a slow vaccine rollout prompting widespread confusion. It's still very complicated and they keep changing things. Only 11 million doses administered so far. That's only a third of the number distributed. Americans now looking for answers on where to get vaccinated and just how effective it is. There's been a great deal of overpromising on timelines. In New York City, a rumor of extra vaccine doses caused chaos near a vaccine site. And with states allowing seniors over 65 to get vaccinated immediately, there's concerns surrounding supply and demand. I worry when I hear announcements, well, let's just open the floodgates and anyone over 65 who wants the vaccine can get it. Well, there's not enough vaccine to meet all that demand. Mayors from 36 cities sending this letter to President-elect Biden, asking him for direct access to vaccines and more funding for distribution. And new vaccine concerns after New York Congressman Adriano Espiat announced he tested positive for COVID Wednesday, despite receiving his second Pfizer vaccine dose last week. It takes two weeks to get full protection, but even then it's only 95% effective. And that's why we still need masks. That's why we still need social distancing. In New Jersey, where the state just announced its next tier of vaccine eligibility to include 2 million smokers, health officials defending the decision. Smoking puts you at significant risk for an adverse result from COVID-19. This mounting frustration across the country now causing suspicion over special treatment and so-called vaccine tourism. We had one of our nursing homes that allowed all of their board members to fly into town, receive the vaccine, and then go back home to New York. And we're seeing these types of instances all over the state. South Dakota State University officials say that they are looking into an alleged discrimination and harassment incident that took place yesterday on campus. A release from the school states that the report of discrimination was directed towards a student living in the residence hall, but did not provide any specific details. On your screen is a tweet from an SDSU football player. 
It was sent out last night. It shows a racial slur smeared on a bathroom mirror. Officials would not confirm if this was the incident that prompted the investigation, but that investigation is ongoing. Monday is, of course, the federal holiday marking Martin Luther King Jr. Day. However, his actual birthday is today, the 15th. The civil rights leader would have been 92 years old, and this year marks the 35th anniversary of the holiday. Signed into law in 1983 and first observed in 1986, the holiday is a deserving tribute to King for advancing civil rights and social justice through nonviolent protests. It could be a profitable weekend for lucky lottery players as two number of people that are on it. It's an important place for the for the public square. But when the Silicon Valley had the ideas for all of these great things, they thought it was going to be utopia, and everyone was going to get along, and people were going to find long-lost friends, and you're going to see the people that you hadn't seen before, seen since high school, and everything was going to be amazing. And there's a lot of good. I, I get it. That it comes from it. I love posting pictures of my dog. But some of the other things that Emily <laughs> went through um, are very real as well. Can I mention one other thing? It's not just yeah. at social media companies. Um, this past week, um, Political Playbook is a, you know, kind of a DC insider publication, but a lot of people read it. They're going through a transition right now, so they've had guest writers all week. Well, yesterday, Ben Shapiro was a guest writer, and it upset some of the newsroom so much that they had, a, had to have a 300-person therapy session because Ben Shapiro, <laughs> who has actually also been quite critical of President Trump, calls balls and strikes for the past five years, that they, had a, that they just went into meltdown. But when Don Lemon had guest hosted and wrote Political Playbook two days before, nobody said a word. Mm -hmm. So it's not just in Silicon Valley. And I think that is the anxiety that conservatives feel, that it does feel like it's coming from everywhere, from your college, from your social media. Given the situation we're in, and it seems to me that the president is ready to move on. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Vice President Mike Pence is expected to attend Biden's inauguration, another sign he's all but become the nation's acting commander-in-chief. On Thursday, he called his successor, Kamala Harris, to congratulate her after thanking National Guard members protecting the Capitol. Thank you all for stepping forward to serve your country. Pence was at the Capitol. The security presence, the, secure, the coordination among federal law enforcement that was responsible for protecting the Capitol. We have seen that there was warnings, that there were warnings coming out of federal agencies. We have seen that there was also a void of intelligence that was shared amongst some of these different government agencies. We've also reported that some in the Defense Department, as well as just some throughout the Trump administration, hesitated to deploy the reinforcements, the backup, the federal assets that was needed at that time. That's one of the main questions that we still have as we continue to report here is why is it that we had this rather modest presence of Capitol Police officers at the Capitol? And it was only until hours after we had this violent, angry mob at the doorstep of the Capitol that you saw more National Guard members as well as tactical agents deployed to help those members of Congress that were forced into a lockdown. And Speaker Pelosi discussed today uh, whether other members of Congress, including allegedly potentially Republicans, were involved. Take a listen to that, Zola. When we're talking about security, we have to talk about truth and trust. In order to serve here with each other, we must trust that people have respect for their oath of office, respect for this institution. We must trust each other respecting the people who sent us here. We must also have the truth, and, when, and that will be looked into. Uh, the, uh, if in fact it is found that members of Congress were accomplices to this insurrection, if they aided and abetted the crime, there may have to be actions taken beyond the Congress. And, and uh, in terms of prosecution for that. Zola? The visitors over here to the White House uh, was Mike Lindell, the founder of MyPillow. Uh, we hear some video of him right here. Uh, this just goes to show you uh, that the White House is still welcoming people over here to the West Wing uh, who have fringe views about the election. Uh, Lindell has been on social media questioning uh, the election results, uh, and there have been some photographers over here, Wolf, who have zoomed in on some of the notes that uh, Mike Lindell was carrying around. 
uh, those notes appear to have some very fringe ideas, uh, just sort of unbalanced views when it comes to the election. Well, we're digging into that, trying to get more uh, on all of that, but it just goes to show you, even after everything that has transpired, they are still welcoming people over to the White House who have fringe ideas about what happened on November 3rd. This is so, so disturbing. Jim Acosta, thank you very much. Let's get some more on the breaking news. Uh, joining us, our chief political correspondent, Dana Bash, and New York Times White House correspondent and CNN political analyst, Maggie Haberman. Uh, Dana, I want to begin with your new reporting that Capitol Police had banned tours for January 6th, the day of the deadly riot, after Democrats raised uh, security concerns. You actually obtained a copy of that memo. Tell us what it reveals. That's right. Well, our colleague Annie Grayer uh, and Ryan Nobles obtained the, the copy of that memo, and I've done a reporting along with them about uh, perhaps what the genesis is of, of re-releasing the guidelines for no tours in that memo. And the answer is, uh, we talked to a lot of lawmakers who were very alarmed at seeing tours in and around the cap Capitol in the days leading up to January 6th. And they were alarmed because there weren't supposed to be tours. Uh, there were not supposed to be any, not just for security reasons, but also because of the pandemic. And for, just for one example, I talked to one lawmaker who saw a group of, of people, tourists perhaps, wearing MAGA attire, hats and, and elsewhere and other things. And this lawmaker went up to a Capitol Police officer and said, why are they here and why aren't they wearing masks? And the uh, cop said, there's nothing I can do about it. They were brought here by a member. And so that is not an isolated anecdote, the one I heard. I heard similar from others. And so the question is, who were those members? We don't know the answer to that. And why did they bring uh, those tourists around? Uh, there's no evidence uh, that we know of, that we have heard, uh, that there was uh, a reconnaissance mission, as some lawmakers have suggested. Uh, but even Nancy Pelosi said today, if there was any lawmaker who acted as an accomplice to this, they should be uh, facing criminal charges, not just, uh, you know, some kind of punishment in the Congress. Yeah, it's so disturbing. Uh, and, and she was very, very blunt in making that charge. You know, Maggie, uh, as Washington uh, transforms into, if you drive around a little bit, into a fortress just ahead of Joe Biden's inauguration, President Trump remains largely out of sight. What's going on? based on all of your reporting inside the White House. Sure, so we'll, uh, one advisor to the president described him as, and I quote, sulking. Um, less that he's railing around screaming at people, although he, he, he has often done that, um, but mostly he is snapping, he is angry, he is, you know, everything that we know that he has been at various points when things aren't going his way, uh, and that's what you're seeing right now. I think the concern for some advisors who have remained in the White House is what happens in the final few days what will he try to do something to try to push back or get attention on himself as this, as you put it, fortress has been created around a, a presidential inauguration, something we have not seen before in this way, at least not in modern history, uh, where people just can't come. And he is, I think, very happy that he is doing things to try to take attention away from Joe Biden. That has often been one of his uh, uh, MOs, but he's going to do supposedly a flurry of pardons. We've been expecting them for a couple of days. I think we will see them in the coming days. There is a divide among his advisors as to whether he ought to go ahead and issue a bunch of pre-pardons, uh, pre basically before, you know, before charges have been filed to uh, a number of people, including members of his family. But that's what we're watching for right now. Yeah, I'm bracing for that too. Uh, I, every journalist here in Washington is getting ready to see those pardons. You know, Dana, typically in the days leading up to an inauguration, and you and I, Maggie, we've covered inaugurations over the years, we see a lot of preparations being made for revelers to gather on the National Mall to watch the president be sworn in, catch a glimpse of the parade. Now the nation's capital resembles a war zone. We've really never seen anything like this before, have we? Not even close. It's, uh, it's so true what you said, that there's usually an excitement in, in the air, uh, no matter which party's uh, pre uh, president has won and is about to be inaugurated. And uh, the opposite is in the air here. It's, it's, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety. And the fact of the matter is, we cannot underscore this enough, uh, tens of thousands of National Guard troops are guarding this city, the nation's capital, because of a threat that was incited by 
the President of the United States, who was on his way out and couldn't accept the reality and is still uh, not accepting the reality in any way, shape, or form, either in private or in public. And it, it, it's really too bad because we do celebrate the peaceful transition of power. And, you know, we talk about the fact that there aren't tanks in the streets. Well, now there's something pretty close. And it's, uh, it, it's a real shame. You know, Maggie, you brought the news that uh, the Vice President, Mike Pence, actually finally, finally called his successor, Kamala Harris, to congratulate her, offer his assistance five days to go until the inauguration. Uh, it's something the President, President Trump, he has not done yet. This is but the latest example of the many ways the President is totally abdicating his responsibilities in these final days in office, isn't it? It's true. Well, I should say that my colleague Jonathan Martin broke that story, not me. I was once again writing his coattails um, in, in a shared byline. Uh, but it's absolutely true that Mike Pence is he's making this call. It is a traditional call in a, in a, in a normal uh, scenario. You have the vice president making that call almost immediately after the election, and if not immediately, then a short time later. We are now many, many days from November 3rd, the election, and Pence is just doing this because the election has now been certified and is, as you say, it is some of the most extensive outreach we have seen from this administration to the incoming uh, White House. You have had complaints from various agencies, some which Trump officials have pushed back on, but particularly uh, Department of Defense, that there were some issues in terms of transition. I think that Biden, excuse me, I think Pence, belatedly is trying to uh, set that message that you know we are we are here to move forward, but there has been a lot of damage in the last. Uh, you know, many days, and it is not just what took place on January 6th, but that was certainly the most visible example. Yeah. All right, guys. So People have been saying, you know, give them hell, get in their face, you know, fight to the finish. They've been saying that since the 18th century. You know, when a Republican says it, it doesn't make him a criminal, it just makes him a politician. Dana, can you compare what we are seeing now in terms of the actual rhetoric and actions by those in politics, by those, for example, the, the backlash now to Congressman Cawthorns, what we're seeing, not just the American public, but actual, again, a letter trying to get him expelled, these, these actual decisions. Can you compare this right now with the Bush 43 administration and what you experienced at that time? Is there any similarities at all? Oh, I mean, kind of put me on the spot there to, uh, to test my memory. I, no, I mean, I, I don't think so. Obviously, you know, there was, remember when Code Pink uh, came into the hearing room and had fake blood on their hands and got in Condol Condoleezza Rice's face while she was testifying in front of the Senate? Um, you know, you've seen th things like this happen over time. I, I think one of the problems that we have right now is that we are now um, eight, nine days since the riot and we still do not have good information about uh, all that what all that happened. We know that the FBI is arresting a lot of people. Okay, we got that, but we don't have a lot more information about um, where uh, all the how it started, what happened, what happened at the barricades, what happened to uh, the police officers who, officers who were who were beaten. And as to, to Tyrus's point in the first block, things decisions are being made about what should happen to people and punishments for people before we even actually have any concrete information as to what happened. That's a real dereliction, I believe, on the part of the different law enforcement agencies. I understand that they're doing investigations, but um, America needs to have more information and soon. Tyrus, to Dana's point, isn't this then just an oversimplification too soon without investigation anyway? No, uh, I don't think it's an oversimplification. I think we've as a, as a country keep making the same mistake where we're not learning from our mistakes. The first mistake we're making is when these violent things happen, we immediately go into the political cover-up. So if it happened on the left side of the field and you're a, a politician on the left, you have to protect the cause and try to justify whatever way you can why they did those things are just a few bad actors, but you know, their, their heart's in the right place because they've been so uh, attacked by President Trump's tweets and then on the right it's the same thing where they're trying to take something from us and what you understand when these people step out because I would argue most hardcore Trump supporters were working not everyone especially during now yeah. during a pandemic we can no one's loading up the family to drive to Washington's now we have bad people they're not 
It, they're not anything else. They're not far left to the galaxy. They are bad people who will say, yeah, I'm a Democrat. And as soon as we start marching for peace, they go loot a footlocker. That's not a Democrat. That's a bad person. And the same thing we're seeing is saying that you're a Trump supporter, no problem. Saying, wearing a MAGA hat, no problem. Once you walk across and decide to put hands on somebody, you are now a human being committing a crime. You're no longer representing your, there's no, that's the problem we're having is, and then we end up with these sides where if I'm a Republican and I say these Republican people who are acting in the name of Republicans to commit a crime or to hurt somebody, take that away. You're, you're a person who made a bad choice or hurt another human being. That's what we need to do. We need to stop giving them cover by saying these extreme right Wing guys storm the castle. No, this group of bad people storm the castle. There's going to be investigations, arrests, and we'll tune in and we'll let you know. Investigate and start calling and taking people. Give accountability. That's what I want to say. I'm there now. Accountability. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> A lot of them will go to jail. So, let's have trial by combat. Those rioters didn't target every random member of the Trump administration. They specifically targeted Pence, who Donald Trump had thrown under the bus and then some. He said Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done, which was posted at 2.24 p.m. At that point, Pence was already in hiding from that mob filled with people who literally said out loud they were there to execute him. We were just discussing that post-reporting with Carol and others, the mob coming within 100 feet of him, as he was hidden in a hideaway with his family and in no position to have Secret Service agents fight off thousands of people who would breach the Capitol. The insurrectionists also had zip ties, they had weapons, some collected at the time, some not. Prosecutors say there's evidence they did intend to capture or assassinate elected officials. Now this actually was a rogue mob that took Donald Trump's words out of proportion. The president also had every single opportunity to get involved, to tell them to stand down. The Post reports, though, that as members of Congress were hidden in the Capitol and they were inside begging for help during the siege, they struggled to get through to the president who, quote, safely ensconced in the West Wing, was busy watching TV images of the crisis unfolding around them to act or even bother to hear their pleas. When Trump finally released that video hours after the rampage, he addressed the insurrectionists by saying, and again, not everything was known then, but quite a bit was, quote, we love you. You're very special. Some of the Republicans who did vote to impeach cited Donald Trump's inaction during the violence as a major factor. Liz Cheney said that Trump could have immediately and forcefully intervened to stop the violence. He didn't. Tom Rice, for hours while the riot continued, the president communicated on Twitter and offered only weak requests for restraint. New signs today, Trump's refusal to admit that the election lie was, of course, ultimately always false, continues to embolden extremists in the view of authorities. Quote, in the video Wednesday, the president did not acknowledge he'd lost November election political reports, and by not doing so, he's seen as giving approval to his followers' plans to wage war, that word is deliberate, quote, war against the establishment. I'm joined by law professor Melissa Murray and Andrew Weissman, a former FBI general counsel, an MSNBC analyst, and of course, a former member of the Mueller probe. Uh, Andrew, what is criminal here and what is impeachable and convictable in the Senate? It's important for people to understand that for the impeachment, it is neither necessary nor sufficient that there be a criminal charge. You could have minor crimes by a president that don't meet impeachment, um, but you could also have conduct that's um, outrageous but not criminal that warrant impeachment. So that latter is important here because in your um, segue here, where you talk about um, uh, Representative Cheney talking about what the president did essentially while this was going on, that alone could be impeachable. Meaning even if you didn't tie the president's actions to uh, being sufficient to instigate, in other words, he didn't somehow know this was gonna happen, which I think is a, a stretch anyway. But even if you found that, you could find that it was impeachable just because when this was happening, the president clearly was approving of it because he took zero steps to 
uh, to prevent it, to dissuade it. In fact, he encouraged it by talking about how these were good people, as you, as you mentioned. Mm. Um, so I think that the um, the impeachment trial um, has a lot of a lot of uh, room to work with, and I similarly think with a criminal case. There actually is a lot of evidence of the president's intent, um, and not just what you played, um, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense if he was not actually trying to encourage this, that he didn't have all the, the kinds of reactions that you would have. He should, if you thought this was a terrible thing, that they didn't just exercise their First Amendment, but they were actually attacking Congress, you would expect him to react by saying, oh my God, let's send in the national troops, let's make sure this stops, what can I do to prevent it? And the fact that he wasn't doing that is really good evidence of his intent at the time. All really important, if disturbing points. Can I ask you a yes or no question, Andrew? Yes, you can. In your view, is the president's conduct here worse than anything uh, you found in the Mueller probe? You know, I think the answer to that is yes, because it goes so much to the undermining of a core democratic function. And um, and I do think here the visual, the seeing it play out is so damaging to our democracy here and abroad. But it is also important to note that undermining the rule of law without a graphic, um, which is what was found in at the very least the second volume of the Mueller investigation, um, is um, really serious. Same question. It's stunning. Want the truth to why I wake up? Side the lines, just work with what the skin. Five instances of what uh, in the lawyers call substantial evidence of obstruction, which is a crime of major federal felony. People go to jail for that. There's a lot of bad stuff outlined in the Mueller probe as a factual matter, which is distinct from what, if anything, Congress decided to do about it. Uh, we all lived through it. We remember it. Uh, same question to you, given all that, Professor. There are so many impeachable offenses that we could have chosen from over the course of four years. I mean, on January 5th, we were talking about the call to the Georgia Secretary of State being the basis of a potential article of impeachment. And that was entirely eclipsed by what happened on January 6th. I mean, that really was, I think, a line in the sand. There has been a lot of low level, um, petty, unorthodox governmental practices that have gone on in this administration. There have been some really huge major issues that have been called to attention, including the Ukraine call and other things that were noted in the Mueller report. But this really was a bridge too far. Um, and although it happened toward the end of this administration, it was indicative of everything that preceded it. Andrew? Andrew, your thoughts? Um, so uh, I, of course, totally agree with Professor Murray, my colleague at, at NYU, um, that you really can look at this um, over four years as an undermining of the rule of law in various ways, whether it is the executive function um, of doing a criminal investigation, tampering with witnesses, um, or um, tampering with um, the 2020 election. So you've seen you know, tampering with the 2016 election, you've seen tampering with the investigation into the uh, 2016 election, and now you have um, what many have referred to as the big lie with respect to the 2020 election and the undermining of the rule of law. Um, but I, I do think it's important to note that well, this is just incredibly serious what we've seen, it is very much the visual that I think has caused people to just be so shocked. Um, and the people in Congress are now sort of actually um, experiencing the undermining of the rule of law in a very visceral public way. But it in fact, as somebody who was in the Department of Justice for over 20 years, it's something 
that we have lived with for four years. Um, and, and as uh, Melissa mentioned, in small ways and big ways. Yeah, I hope people are hearing uh, what both of you are saying here. Uh, the whole reason that you have rule of law and law enforcement is so you don't get to those scenes. This is not a murderous education that a civil society wants to live through to be reminded why you have those things. And so the attacks on everyone from uh, former FBI Director James Comey, uh, who joins us, by the way, on MSNBC Next Hour, but who who's firing um, amidst the Russia probe was part of the uh, alleged obstruction that led to the Mueller probe, uh, as well as the attacks on everyone from Hillary Clinton to Joe Biden to Barack Obama to journalists, all of that was a president pressing as far as he could and firing people who wouldn't carry out the things that you documented in your investigation. Uh, a would-be autocrat, if he could get away with it, um, seeking that through illegality and violence that he couldn't get through democracy. And so, as you say, it started somewhere else. It got to here. Um, Professors Murray and Weissman, thanks to both of you. The stimulus check, if you're going to give us money so we can get things going again, you hold off on the other stuff. You fix one tire to get the car rolling before you, you don't try to change all the flats at once. And we're seeing the same thing where it's just being dragged out <laughs> over and over again. We're going to do this. We're going to add this. Pork bellies. Make sure panda bears are getting enough bad, um, bamboo and trying to do this. Stop all that ridiculousness. If you're going to give stimulus checks, then you tell the American people we cannot make, make rage higher until we get our economy on track. Start telling people the truth, tell them what we can do and what we can't do. That would be so phenomenal. <laughs> Emily, lots of talk after Biden's speech last night about him being empathetic rather than the showman that Donald Trump was. What was your reaction to the Biden speech? Did you like it? Yeah, I think he's always, he is always a more calm deliverer, of course. I think this shouldn't be surprising at all. I will say that I think he is wasting a significant amount of time right now capitulating to the far left, talking about a federal minimum wage and arguing into the ridiculous goalpost shifting direct cash payment debate and the lockdown relief bill debate when he should be focusing on opening the economy and recognizing that, Tyrus, to your point, all of these factors are intertwined. The two biggest concerns for CEOs and business owners this year are, yes, the coronavirus and also a recession. Those two are linked, and his policies should be focused on maintaining employment for the average American and how everyone will thrive in that capacity. All right, thanks, Emily. Ahead, NBA legend Charles Barkley's outrageous comments on who should get special treatment for the vaccine. The controversy, next for you on The Five. Has, uh, to join us. Uh, you've, you've done some amazing reporting, Shimon. Tell us what you learned. Yeah, for the first time, Wolf, we get to hear from these officers. Some of them, we've seen the video of them being crushed and pushed by many of the members of the operations for the Department of Transportation. If they agree, the proposal is then brought to the Department Secretary, who makes the final decision. So this last event, just kind of looking at what those forecasts were, um, more snow continuing after our plows had already left the road, uh, winds coming up, and of course going into the night being darkness and, and really decreasing that visibility. Officials add drivers should remain vigilant to give space to the car in front of you and give yourself extra time to reach your destination. Crew spending last night and much of this morning watching for hot spots at the Edgewater apartment complex in Pier. The fire starting Thursday evening. The cause of this is still under investigation, but officials believe it started on the back side of the building. All residents were able to evacuate safely, but many lost all of their belongings. According to Dakota Radio Group and Pier, volunteer fire chief Ian Paul said high winds made this scary situation even more difficult. Help is available for those impacted. They can contact the Pier Area Referral Service at 605-224-8731 for assistance. The coronavirus has claimed 15 more lives in South Dakota. That is according to the latest report from the DOH. COVID-19 claiming a total of 1,629 lives in South Dakota. Officials reporting 425 new cases as well, with active cases sitting at more than 4,700. The number of people currently hospitalized by the disease fell by 20, that number now 227. Officials do say that more than 44,000 44, South Dakotans have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. 
National Guard troops continue to pour into Washington from across the country. 21,000 soldiers will be part of an unprecedented security force for the inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden. NBC's Dre Gay has been following this story on the ground in D.C. since the attack on the Capitol, and he has continued coverage for us here for. The core of the nation's capital right now looks more like a military base. Armed soldiers and police standing guard around the clock. Miles of security fencing, streets barricaded. The National Mall, where hundreds of thousands usually gather for the inauguration, shut down. I'm sad about it. I have to tell you that it, that it looks that way. Uh, I'm committed uh, to making sure that we, we get our city back. Federal agents continuing to monitor threats of violence from right-wing extremists. An internet chatter suggesting Washington may not be the only target. All 50 state FBI JTTFs in the four territories are working 24 hours a day to pursue every lead, every credible threat. State capitals across the country, we are ready. Stepping up security after warnings about armed protesters gathering through the weekend. We have uh, SWAT teams and uh, sharpshooters on standby. The deadly takeover of the Capitol. And it was just chaos. It was just pure chaos. And the words of officers on the ground there. Guys were trying to grab my gun and they were chanting like killing with his own gun. Graphic and painful reminders that a peaceful transition of power right now requires an unprecedented level of protection. Jay Gray, NBC News, Washington. As coronavirus numbers continue to rise across the nation, efforts to administer the vaccine remain slow, something that the incoming Biden administration hopes to change. Today, the president-elect tapped Dr. David Kessler to lead federal vaccine efforts. Kessler is moving up from his current role as co-chair of the Transitions Coronavirus Task Force. He previously led the U.S. Food and Drug Administration under President George H.W. Bush and President Bill Clinton. Investigators are working around the clock to capture those responsible for last week's attack on the U.S. Capitol. Federal officials say that they have opened up almost 300 criminal cases and have charged nearly 100 people in connection to the pro-Trump riots. Shocking new details also being released today, showing that the riot was extraordinarily violent and posed mortal danger to the top members of the United States government. Riders were heard on video chanting, Hang Mike Pence. Well, winter certainly made its presence felt over the past 24 hours. Looks like it's going to stick around and even be cool in the coming days. Tyler has to check the forecast when we come back. Right now, join Planet Fitness for no enrollment and get moving in our... I can communicate with patients now in a way I never could before. They have their own EKG in their pocket. With Cardio Mobile, the FDA cleared personal EKG device, you can take a medical grade EKG in just 30 seconds. reporting on the militia movement up there or as you always put it the guys you went to high school with talk about your concerns not just in Lansing but in Washington in Augusta Maine Sacramento Tallahassee we've got 50 capitals to worry about yes but it was Michigan back in April when uh, armed uh, militia showed up and took over the building went into the Senate uh, gallery uh, looking down on the senators with their guns, their long guns. And we didn't do anything about it. We, they were not arrested. They were not removed. And in fact, uh, uh, the, the, the Capitol people just shut the building down for the next day or two. As soon as you allow any of these people to get away with this, what was the message in April? Well, that was easy. You know, what else could we do? I see this as the first wrong step that we took, we, the law-abiding citizens, by allowing these Michigan militia guys to take over our capital back then, that nothing was done about it. Then they showed up at the home of our Secretary of State after the election. She was putting up Christmas decorations with her, her child, and they all line up on the sidewalk outside the front of her house with guns. You know, Brian, I don't know. 
I was raised with if 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 you show up on my doorstep with a gun, I need to take some sort of action, starting with nine one one or something. Something has to happen. You're not allowed to intimidate. So I think that's the first mistake, and I think we made it in Michigan. Um, and uh, and then of course came the kidnapping and all this. But I'm I'm very worried about this. And I was talking to your producer about this earlier. That I don't hear enough people saying that that um, we should be concerned about the National Guard at our nation's capital, all the police that are coming in. The, that's the problem. The police, the, the Capitol Police, and God bless the ones who did all the right things and fought back, but there's 2,300 Capitol Police, and that day, they only 400, 400 to 500 were called to, to show up. 1,900 at home. This thing, this is an inside job. I'm sorry, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm barely a theorist. But I have to tell you that if you're just a common sense person, something isn't right here. Uh, Brian, I've been in the Capitol building 100 times in the last three decades, filming, whatever. I could not tell you how to get to Nancy Pelosi's office. It's such a maze. It's a maze within a maze. And all the tunnels underneath, the fact that they knew right where to go, the fact that they could, they understood the tunnels, everything. They, the only way you could do that is if you have help from either a member of Congress, in this case, a Republican member or two or five, uh, Republican staffers uh, or Capitol Police. It's the only way they knew how to do what they did. And what they say there's gonna be an investigation. I'm sorry, that was 10 days ago. There's security cameras everywhere. They know exactly who the Republican members of Congress were that took them around the day before to show them how to get into here and how to get into there. They already know who they are. That's why there's, that's why there's been no big press conference with all the chiefs of police and all that from all the agencies. They had one today with the mayor, nice, good woman. Um, but who's not there? The Capitol Police weren't there at the press conference. The FBI wasn't there. Homeland Security wasn't there. It's it's like, what is going on here? And and I think, again, just that maybe this is just by instinct as a documentary filmmaker, I don't know, but clearly they don't want to talk to you or the press or the public until they get their story straight. And what they do know is that dozens, maybe more than dozens, uh, you know, I heard on your nightly newscast uh, tonight that uh, there is an incredible number of military, ex-military police and ex-police that were there participating in the riot. And they know that. And they, and they are investigating, I think, 12 to 15 police departments around the country because they've identified officers from those police departments that took the day off and came to DC to participate in an insurrection against this country. And the fact, I know they're, they're reporting now, oh, we've got police coming on Wednesday from New York and Houston and, and uh, New Orleans and all over. Who's supposed to feel good about that? I mean, I mean seriously, yeah. if you're black or brown, I watched Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez two hours ago on this network, if you, if you are of color, if somebody says to you, oh, don't worry, the police are coming, the National Guard's coming. We know from our own reports from the Pentagon that they've issued in recent years about the National Guard, about our military, sadly, and about our police. These police departments are full of white supremacists, white supremacist uh, uh, sympathizers, racists, this is true in our police. It's sadly true in our military. It's true in the National Guard. To think that, oh, there's 20,000 National Guards surrounding the whole area here. I'm, I'm supposed to feel good about that when we now know and we have video of police helping. There's that one shot you guys showed today. They're over, the one cop is opening the gate and say, come on, come on in, everybody. You know? There's, this brings yeah, I don't no know comfort. much, but I don't think they're supposed to do that. Um, Last hey, Michael, hang on a problem. second. Let me let me sw let me uh, uh, sneak in a break. Uh, there's another topic I want to get you on the record on. 
when we come right back. Breathable, but extremely durable. My Giza sheet. Talk about setting up these federal vaccination sites, uh, making sure that the federal government is actually coordinating uh, with pharmacies, using FEMA, maybe using the National Guard. And then in terms of uh, speeding things up, uh, he talked about raising the eligibility uh, for who can get vaccines. And essentially, the core idea was we should never have vaccines that are just sitting in freezers uh, unused. But yeah, this is a really daunting task. And uh, I think we actually have sound of Biden talking today in Wilmington uh, just about what a big undertaking this is going to be. Our plan is as clear as it is bold. Get more people vaccinated for free. Create more places for them to get vaccinated. Mobilize more medical teams to get the shots in people's arms. Increase supply and get it out the door as soon as possible. This will be one of the most challenging operational efforts ever undertaken by our country. But you have my word. We will manage the hell out of this operation. You know, I will say um, these ideas that we heard today, they were pretty familiar ideas. They were ideas that Biden has talked about before. So I think in the coming weeks, uh, what we will need to see from the Biden administration and his COVID team, uh, including Dr. Gounder, will be the fine details of exactly how his administration is going to execute every single one of these ideas. So uh, I see you nodding your head, Dr. Gounder, because Biden is hoping for 100 million vaccine vaccines in his first or vaccinations in his first 100 days um but but clearly the reality is, is that supplies are limited right now is that goal realistic look don he remains really committed to this goal of 100 shots in 100 days if you look at how many americans are dying from coronavirus right now we've hit a death toll of about 4,000 people dying a day across the country that is not acceptable. If we allow that to continue at that pace, we're in for a, a more than doubling of the overall death toll in this country over the next 100 days. So he is very committed to making sure that we accelerate the pace of vaccination, that we do it more efficiently and yet equitably. Mm -hmm. uh, $18,000 and expulsion from the organization could result, but could some of these so-called speech codes be testing legal limits? Let's bring in our legal eagles to discuss. Civil rights attorney Robert Patillo and Washington Times legal affairs reporter and attorney Alex Swear. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Shannon. Hey, Shannon. Okay, so my understanding of this is it literally is speech that you utter, things you post online, personal and professional accounts. They say it's about making sure that there's not hate speech or discriminatory actions or speech towards certain classes, protected classes, that kind of thing. Um, also from Real Clear investigation, Investigations, Exhibit A. Uh, the decision allowing any member of the public to file a complaint has alarmed other real estate agents and also some legal and ethics experts who say hate speech ban on vagueness is an invitation to censor controversial political opinions, especially on race and gender. I mean, Robert, who decides what's hate speech and, and how the heck do you make sure people don't file a bunch of phony complaints? Uh, well, one, this is a professional association, so it's a, uh, it's a privilege to be a member, not a right to be so. Just as the, if you're a, a lawyer, there's character and fitness, you have to meet certain criteria, which are set by the... Seems more like a human rights and health outrage. Does this come as any solace to you? Not at all. I, I'm shocked that he was charged with only two misdemeanors. Um, he, over, he oversaw the, taking the city of Flint off the the pure water that came from Lake Huron, and they wanted to save money, and they wanted to make money by build, by privatizing the water system and building a new pipe to Lake Huron and charging more mm -hmm. for it. That's what this is really all about. And and instead, they said, let let them drink from the Flint River. We can save more money that way. And and what happened was in, in doing that. It's this was seven years ago. This is everybody in Flint who drank the water was poisoned on some level with some sort of toxic material in them, but it was the children. Children who ingest lead, it never leaves them. They, the effect on them, them is permanent. There are over 10,000 children in Flint with permanent, I mean permanent, lifetime brain damage. There's no way to fix it. There's no way to change it. 
these children were ruined by this when they discovered just how bad it was after a year or two of this thing they covered it up this is a much bigger crime the one way it intersects with what's going on right now is that we this governor must not be let off the hook he has to be prosecuted for the actual crimes that he did and the president of the united states if they do not try him and convict him the message to all other politicians is have at it and especially if it's a city that's poor and black have at it even more because nothing's going to happen to you that's what that is what they have learned if that's the lesson for future presidents when this happens with trump we're all doomed with this but the people of flint and still will not drink the water and it's the governor got away with this but but the misdemeanor is not enough it needs more and and i just will repeat again because uh, i know we're out of time the um last wednesday january 6th was a dry run now, they told the insurgents told all their members leave your guns at home don't bring your guns they wanted to see how far they could get what they're going to do in the next Michael, five days i fear is going to be more violent uh and that's my warning we'll and i hope watching some with of you we'll be Thank watching you, with you we'll have you back on thanks for coming on as usual again happy new year michael moore our guest tonight coming up for us the people working under the strain of chasing down the latest strain of coronavirus from the uk all the way here to the u.s and we have a look at what we might be in for see going forward with election integrity it's hard to say people like that weren't trying to uphold um, and, and serve in, in professional ways as a lawyer yeah, and Robert, I mean, it's not just lawyers, but members of Congress who are being um, told, you challenge the election, that means that you violated some ethical canon or that you're a bad person, you shouldn't be a lawyer, you shouldn't have your degree from Harvard, whatever it is. Um, but there are a lot of folks out there who will say, um, listen, that's a difference of opinion. There were Democrats who have objected to electors in the past. So why now is it sort of the unpardonable sin? Well, I think because you have to have, uh, you know, all the kinds of the good faith basis for your actions. That you know, I, I think we ended up with a one in 64 record on these uh, these sorts of judicial challenges to the uh, to the election, and many of these cases were brought in, brought in bad faith. They were brought for, uh, brought for political reasons. I think they do need to investigate and weed these people out because you have an ethical responsibility to the United States Constitution. You have an ethical responsibility to the bar, uh, which you're a member of. You have an ethical uh, responsibility to your client to inform them that you're not going bring frivolous suits and we cannot simply excuse that because it's during a political election yeah and like everything else did to to separate the legit from the illegit uh, is an important thing to do and yeah there are ramifications if you do the latter uh, Robert and Alex thank you both have a great weekend thanks Shannon thanks Shannon now selling is simple to see your simple si and comparisons. Of course, the comparison is incredibly unfair. For start, easy to explain. That was that. Damn well, I was a snake before. You and the second time, she was very ridiculous feeling. You can't even put it into words. Strap from the landing gear underneath. Republican Party that dismissed his first impeachment is responsible for any of these actions that are happening today. I called in right after the impeachment 